The following is an excerpt from the 100 Years of War, a famous manual of dwarven battle tactics. Knolls remain a threat across all seasons. Happily, our redoubts are too fortified for their tastes, but caravans, foraging expeditions, and patrols must deal with them. Knolls take care to move quietly when they are on the hunt for prey. The events that presage their presence are easy to misinterpret as the results of other threats. A scout might go missing, a caravan fail to arrive on time, or a village be left deserted. Several kinds of creatures, such as orcs and goblins, can cause such events, but the evidence that gnolls leave of their involvement is unmistakable. Their enemies aren't merely killed, they are dismembered and devoured. The loot that other marauders would scoop up is left where it falls, of no use to a creature that requires only flesh to feed its urges. If you suspect that gnolls are encroaching on dwarven territory, send reliable spies to human settlements in the region while pulling back as many of our folks as you can manage. Instruct the spies to pass along updates each day, preferably by messenger bird. Do not tell the spies of your suspicions. Invent a story, such as the search for an outlaw or some other deception. If a spy fails to report, you must strike quickly. Send your fastest warriors and strongest spellcasters to the spy's location. If the gnolls have struck a settlement, they will rest up for a week or so, bloated by their kills. In this state, they are their most vulnerable. Surround the place in silence, and advance as one to catch them in a vice. Let none survive. A single knoll can, over time, create a new warband. Some may argue for an approach that doesn't rely on the loss of human life to see it succeed. I would gladly suggest one, if such existed. Your best strategy is to defend our halls and let humans serve as bait. Moradin knows they multiply quickly enough that their losses will soon be recouped. It's a Mimic, the roundtable Dungeons & Dragons discussion podcast, where you never know what you're going to get. Welcome to another episode in our conversation on mob mentalities, where we look at some of the ravenous humanoids out there that can make up the enemy and armies in Dungeons & Dragons. I'm Dan, and with me today is Adam. Hello! And this episode Hello. is called No Warbands, Putting the Laughter... And slaughter. Slaughter. I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> I knew it. This one is one of those visual puns. Oh, that's what that is. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know how long it took me to realize that laughter was the majority of the word slaughter? Nope. Oh, years. Years. I'm ashamed to admit it was probably around the time you had a tiefling named laughter where you pointed that out and I went, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. We've reached out to our army of friends and allies to help us break down what a Null Warband looks like in 5th edition. First though, let's jump into the basics and see what the Monster Manual and Volo's Guide to Monsters has to offer. Okay, hold on, but before anything else, yeah, we've done Knolls before. Oh, we're circling back to Knolls. And I fucking love Knolls. Do you remember the last time we did this? We actually ended up playing like Hyena Laughter off of yep. was Terry's phone. Yeah. Right? Um... And so uh, people should go back and listen to episode 43, which was uh, The Fast and the Furious. Yeah. I'm just killing it with these fucking yeah. names. Yeah. So, um, but we really dig into a lot of the Yinagu, um The lore Yinagu lore and, 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 and his whole thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but there's no real mechanical breakdowns or anything in there. We talked about kind of what you should expect from um, Knowles and, and the lore and the flavor. We're going to get into the like, nitty gritties of mechanics and stuff. There's probably going to be a little bit of overlap because how can you have one conversation with the other? Yeah. But, well, uh, my plan is based on my notes here that we're going to do a bit of a survey of what a knoll is, but it's not going to be anywhere near as in depth of a coverage as we had with episode 43. That being said, some of the more war band and their society stuff that we're going to talk a little bit more about yeah and the specifics of what you're going to find in the war band and tactics and exactly that kind of shit yeah. that, so that's today um but if you want the the lore go check out episode 43 exactly so starting off for those of you who are not going to go listen to episode 43 which why just why why would you do that go listen to episode 43 if you've listened to it already go listen to it again anyways so for those of you who aren't going to go back and listen um the just kind of cover what a knoll is for those who don't understand. A knoll is a feral dog-like humanoid thing. They most of them are. Most of them are. They sound kind of like hyenas and they kind of come from hyenas, but they are their own terrifying thing. These guys can grow up to nine feet tall. 
um, and are just massive and imposing. And I, you can't stress it enough, feral. Now, nine feet tall. What's interesting here is there are some large creatures that are only eight feet tall. Yes. So I think that it's nine feet when they're not hunched over. You see the the walking gait of a of a hyena or of a knoll. Yeah. And they they are very hunched forward with their their necks are the top of their head is but even with their shoulders, right? So um, they're always kind of in my eyes they're dar- or they're darting around. They're they're looking for mm-hmm. the next thing. They're consistently hunting. Yeah. I mean, their entire cause for existence is to raid and to consume and to ravage and savage things. Um, they slaughter wholesale, and that is their entire goal. If they are not slaughtering a peasant village, they're attacking the other gnolls within the warband. They are just a wave of death. Um, they are also cannibals. They will eat everything, including their own dead, um, as well as their victims. So uh, their entire goal, their entire ethos is to uh, raid, consume. They hold no well, uh, no idea of monetary wealth. It is all just practical slaughter. It's funny, you know, I don't even see them as being able to craft or anything. They get no, lo- me neither. Yeah. They get long bows and I'm like, where the fuck did you get that from? Because, dude, you are not a Fletcher. There's not a Fletcher among you. The They're- dead body of an yeah. elf. Yeah, they're picking this up off the ground, right? And well, it, it it does say, and uh, I almost said YOLOs. No, VOLOs. VOLOs, yeah. Uh, it does say in VOLOs that you can have a bunch of gnolls raid a town. And if that town has a magic shop, the gnolls are going to go in and grab the things that will help them do one of two things. Kill or eat. If it doesn't help them kill and it doesn't help them eat, they will leave it alone. So a gremlins. So a shiny little, so a shiny ring, or a cloak of resistance, or any of these kind of things. Anol's just gonna walk by. They'll grab the plus two sword because it's a sword, not because it's plus two, right? And they'll grab the sling. They're more, they're more uh, likely to grab shards of the broken glass that they could use to stab something. Then pick up a wizard's. Spell then book. to pick up yeah. a spell book, right? Um, now they were created with the sense of slaughter by the demon Lord of slaughter himself, Yanogu. Um, again, listen to episode 43 for a deep dive, but we also talked about him as a, uh, warlock patron as well mm-hmm. in, uh, in our second Hall- warlock in yeah. our Halloween special last year. Yeah. yeah. Um, so he is, all he cares about is slaughter. He would be happy if. Um, and his whole goal is to sit on a world of destruction and ruin as the sole survivor. That is what Yanogu wants. Simple. Eating the garbage off the ground of the decaying flesh of the dead. Yep. Yep. He is metal as shit. And I love him. My favorite thing about him is that, because um, he created all gnolls, right? Yep. Uh, er- gnolls themselves never actually get their hunger satiated because a-, a little while after they eat that food in their stomach transports into Yanagu's stomach. Cool. So he gets the benefit of all of their feasting. Well, there's there's an interesting little thing about this hunger that we will talk about later, where it does kind of give them a sense of clarity if they eat the flesh of the intelligent dead, right? So I wish eat, that this would be reflected in their stat block. I, I, I agree. So if they eat the flesh of the intelligent dead, they get this sense of clarity. And this is when a uh, null war band raiding party whatever you want to call it will actually stop and rest and they'll be able to have a very short and very hostile social encounter yeah right and but within uh the book has kind of changes its opinion it goes between an hour to a day or two that hunger will be back and just as furious as ever and the gnolls will be on the move again gnolls don't sleep Gnolls don't rest when they're a slave to this hunger, which is the vast majority of their existence. They just are on the move always. There's not a knoll village. They don't sleep, really? No, they don't. They go, 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 go until they eat that flesh of the intelligent dead. And at that point, they will rest, not sleep, rest. And they will get up and go again. Now, there's a very good reason for this. Because of their direct, almost lineage to the demon lord, Yanogu. Somebody needs to get those guys a Snickers. Uh, 
a pile of Snickers. You, you, you've seen those images of like the car crash, uh, the, the big semi truck crashes where like it'll be a truck full of dice and there'll just be dice all over the road. Yeah. yeah they need that just with Snickers. Snicker also means laughter and they're hyena people. So like, I'm, yeah, yeah I, 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 yeah. I, I saw, saw it. And right. we, we could have named this putting the knickers in Snickers. That has a different connotation to Terry. Yes. Yeah. Anyways, so this direct lineage comes from the fact that when Yanogu was raiding the material plane, the dead behind him were consumed by these hyena packs. These hyena packs would eat and eat and eat and eat until they literally exploded from consumption. And from the corpses of that explosion grew the gnolls. And this that is continues how, to this day. That continues to this day. That is how gnolls reproduce. They don't have nice little knoll babies that are really, really cute. Like we always have that uh, dilemma. What do you kill? A uh, Do you kill the goblin babies when you clear a goblin warren? Do you kill the orc babies? Like, I mean, they're evil creatures, but do you? Do you really? There are no problems with the gnolls. That's not a problem with gnolls. It is straight up. They will, at the end of their life cycle, eat until they are so full that they explode and spawn more gnolls. So, um, this is a frequent occurrence throughout. Uh, hyena bands will follow gnoll war bands around, like uh, hyena pro- uh, groups, prides, packs. Packs. will follow uh, uh, gnolls around and consume those corpses and then explode into more gnolls as well, right? So it, it really plays into the fact that gnolls are just little Yanogu. But that being said, now that we know how they're created... Sorry, hyenas are clans or a cackle. A cackle of hyenas. Yeah. Oh, I want to put that into gnolls somehow. Yeah, that's uh, that's going to go in my in my gnoll campaigns. A uh, 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 a, a titter of gnolls. Uh, no. Because tittering? No. Nope. It's a form of laughing? No. Nope. No? No. Nope. What, what's a tittering? Oh, no, it, it is, but they're war bands, Dan. That's, that's what... They have a thing already. I, I Yes, I know, but, like, there's got to be another thing. Oh, well. Anyways, moving on. Um, so, as it uh, kind of flows with the logic... Knolls, because they have no home, they are straight up nomads. They move as waves, as packs, as warbands throughout the landscape, slaughtering and destroying whatever they can, but they're smart about it. They will go for easy targets um, and avoid, if their numbers aren't good enough, these well-armored, well-fortified settlements. So they will stay in the one place, which is usually the ruins of a settlement they destroy, just long enough to eat all of the dead, burn anything uh, that is standing and burnable and flammable to the ground before they move on to the next assault. Now they don't eat rotten flesh, though, right? They eat the the recent. They eat the dead. yeah. They're they not eat the digging recent, up graves. Yeah. They're they're not eating like spoiled meat. Exactly. Right, but they, they probably smell like spoiled meat. They probably do. Yeah. Um, now, as we mentioned earlier as well, they don't craft, um, all of their arms and armor are scavenged off the dead. They will, uh, they will, the only kind of thing that they ever mention is them crafting is they will make trophies that they will wear. This is going to be things that is usually like ears, teeth, noses. I kind of imagine a, uh, knoll with a dwarf dick necklace flapping around as he charges through the mountainous lands. No, those things are delicacy, man. There's no reason that they would preserve those and not eat them. That's fair. Maybe it's the one knoll that got like punched in the face by several barbarians and doesn't have the teeth to mile down on them. It's okay. It can suck. Anyways, with knolls, there's no altruism, no goodness, no empathy, no compassion at all. Um, they're completely devoid of conscience. And full stop cannot be taught to be different. We saw with orcs that if an orc is raised in a civilized society, it kind of loses a lot. Like it's still got anger issues, but it's still a civilized humanoid. This isn't the same for gnolls. Gnolls are savagery embodied and they are not to be trusted at any point in time. If there is no common target for any gnolls tribe or no warband's fury, they will then fight amongst each other. And that will last as long as there is no target. However, a gnoll warband will go searching for more targets if it has none ready to it, right? They will go to everything from small villages to knoll, uh, sorry, to goblin uh, tribes, to dug in kobolds, like they'll hit 
anything around. If it's got an intelligence score, it wants it dead and it wants to eat it. I think they're smart enough to avoid walled kingdoms and forts as a general rule. Yeah. Like they're going to know that they're not going to be able to get there. They'll pick off the surrounding farmlands, right? But they're they're going to if they cannot lay siege to it because they they don't have catapults, they don't have battering rams. Just, they will run up to the front door and just pound on it until it splinters, right? Um it did mention that um they do have some limited siege tactics to them. They will uh in kind of like the World War Z movie they will z it's world war z i know we're up in canada we say zed however the name of the book in the movie is world war z yeah. sure so uh it's so wrong it feels it like really it's is. like gravel in my mouth i know like, what the fuck is a z right z nah, anyways it. fuck um i'm married an american so like it's constant argument here because we're homeschooling our kids right now and my kids will do their alphabet and i'll just wait i'll sit there and wait until they get to that last letter and then I'll just yell at Zed, shoot daggers across to Shanna. Yep, there's a right way and a wrong way to do things, and that right way is a Canadian way. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So, anyways, um, so what they will do is they will they will climb on the corpses of the dead to get up the walls if they need to. They, they won't make ladders. They, they don't make, make ladders. Piles. Exactly. Right. And the only way a no warband is going to assault a walled fortress like this is if they have those kind of numbers ready. Yeah. Okay. Um, real quick, I do want to talk a little bit about the mechanics of Ianogu. Um, since a lot of no life is modeled after this guy. And if you ever need any inspiration of how to run your gnolls, look into Ianogu. Um, he, uh, he comes from the abyss and is specifically a realm called the Death Dells. And he is CR 24. He has a massive abyss forged flail. That has a 16 to hit and a D12 plus 9 bludgeoning damage up to, and get this, 15 feet away. Delicious. Yes. I love that. Um, he does have some spells and the ability to sniff out magic at will, as well as dispelling said magic. Basically, he wants this to be a martial fight and any of you fiddly spellcasters could just stop. Well, the thing about Ienogu is uh, he keeps finding a way into the, into the material plane and dicking around and creating as much havoc as possible. Until someone banishes him away. Yeah. And so you got to feel like he just hates magic. Yeah. I mean, that would be why he has dispel magic. He has... It also explains why he's got a, uh, an argument with, the, like, a rivalry with Baphomet. It's yeah. all about... Um, Baphomet has, like, arcane training as part of his Well, thing. experimentation is his deal, right? Yeah. Like, arcane experiments. So that makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. Um, he has this ability to dispel. He has this ability to cause fear because he's a demon lord and... Needs the spell cause fear as well as just, you know, looking in a mirror. And he is a hideous motherfucker. He is he is terrifying. Yeah. Um he also has the ability, and this is this is uh the most beautiful part. He has the ability to turn invisible at will. <laughs> now, there's nothing to me more scary than a invisible CR twenty four demon lord. Yep. But, you know, if things get really hairy for him and that doesn't end up deterring your party, pretty hairy. he will teleport away. He has he has a free teleport once a day. I do cover his insanity thing. Do you? Yes, I do cover his insanity thing. Okay, you do you. I, I want to look it up. Okay. So, Ianogu has a vision of a world in smoking and blood-soaked destruction. He wants a realm of endless war, death, and fighting, and all gnolls are the extension of that rage and need for want and chaos. When the last hero is dead, it is said, Ianogu is... Then to come back to the realm and preside over a world of rot and carnage. This is one of the reasons why one of his most famous monikers is the Beast of Butchery. Um, he is also one of the most, if not the most, active demon lord on the material plane. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and he has many followers outside of Knolls. Although all these non Knoll cultists of Yonogu take on the savagery and cannibalism of... Of the feral god spawn gnolls. We're actually going to talk about what a, you know, cultist looks like next yeah, episode. Exactly. I mean, you, when you look at them, just to give you guys a kind of taste for next episode, they're nihilistic, traumatized, isolated sociopaths almost exclusively. And they will walk hunched over and file their teeth to points. Yanogu will select the most deranged of the lot and fill their dreams with horrors and viscera calling them out to enact new slaughters in their communities. Otherwise, 
the Lord of Savagery, as he's known, will communicate to his feral beastmen and his mundane humanoids alike through omens. Now, with a lot of these savage, feral, bestial type mobs, omens are always going to be a big thing and they're going to be different for each mob. Um, the omens of a goblin are going to be different from the omens of an orc are going to be different from the omens of a gnoll. Yeah. Now, the omens of a gnoll are going to be things like a, sor- a sourceless laughter on in the wind or the cracking of bone or the smell of freshly torn flesh. Yeah. yeah. Right? It's, it's, the, these guys are about as savage as you're going to get. The, the barbarian is going to look at them and be like, dude. Calm down. Yeah. Yeah. Tone it back about 80%. But, yeah, so. right? Um. So the one way they do kind of craft crude weapons is from the bodies of their enemies. If their enemies and their victims do not have weapons on them. So they will file femurs to points if they have no other option. Yeah, I like the fact that your average gnoll gets a spear attack. I mean, most of them do. They get they get spears and arrows and mm-hmm. stuff. And in my head, they're just sharpening bones. Or they're like lashing sharp bones to the end of a stick. Yeah, and right. that is as complicated as they're going to get with yeah. that, right? Uh, now... Yenogu will corrupt the minds of his followers um, with this same hunger that the gnolls suffer from. This this constant nagging desire, need, um, drive even to consume and, and create violence. Um, the hunger is for violence and the corpses of specifically intelligent dead. Yes, but they will kill anything. They will kill anything that moves in their It's way. just, if they eat a fucking cow, it doesn't satiate yeah. the hunger. So this hunger is a lot like a drug. It is it is this um, addiction to consumption and violence. Um, In my head, it's like a fucking migraine. Like, I get migraines and I cannot do anything else except have the freaking migraine. I can't even sleep because I have a migraine. Yeah, me right? too. I get them, I get them so, as well. So, like, in my head, this is a migraine of the gut. Where you yep. just, you need to eat because you can't do anything else to try to make this. I view it as like the world's most effective upper for a knoll. Like it, it wanders through the land without rest to sate the hunger. The hunger is only fully sated when a large scale destruction is at hand. Um, when it is chasing that, it is bright eyed. It is attentive to what's going around. It is always searching for something to consume and, and destroy and murder. Um, this, uh, but I, I, I see them kind of itching or scrambling or thirsting for more at all times. Um, now, gnolls will operate almost exclusively under the ideas of strength to overcome their enemies, hunger to slay in Yonogu's name, and fear to make a tool, sorry, a tool to make easy prey. That That is kind of their whole modus, uh, MO, modus operandi. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Got it right. Okay. We do want to talk real quick about Yanogu's madness. Yeah. Now, Yanogu's madness, uh, there is a chart in uh, Mordenkainen's uh, where it kind of details what this madness can do. And Adam, you've, you've got it open there in front of you. What, what are we looking at for this? So it's a D100 table, yeah. right? Um, but it is just broken up into five sections, like 20 by 20 by 20, mm-hmm. right all the way through it. Um, and the idea here is um, if you are in Yanogu's lair... Or within line of sight of the Demon Lord. So just seeing him. That tracks. Yeah. Roll on the madness of Yunagu's table to determine the nature of the madness. So I'm only going to give two examples out of the five. But yep. uh, my favorite ones are uh, your the, like your PC. The madness that they're going to get is uh, I hunger for the deaths of others. And I'm constantly starting fights in the hopes of seeing bloodshed. So it's like a brand new D&D player. Yep. Or uh, the flesh of other intelligent creatures is delicious. I just see, like, your peace-loving druid struggling with that one. My favorite thing about it is that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to take chunks out. I just picture the druid, like, leaning over and licking the halfling. So, but then again, that's just me. Come talk to me after the show. Um, <laughs> the other cool thing about the madnesses as well is that it kind of lines up um, with Yunogu specifically because, um, now, all demon lords get a madness, right? Yeah. Like, that, that triggers that's, for all the demon lords. And, I mean, if you... Uh, uh, Ascribed to their cults, there's different levels of madness and stuff you could get as well. Yeah, but he's actually got on his flail um, uh, a couple of things that happen. There's three heads on the flail. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that when you swing it, you randomly choose with his multi-attack which one you're going to trigger. Yeah. You can only do one per multi-attack. So, you you know, once per round, each one of these. But you, the DM, gets to choose. Okay. Uh, And one of them is a confusion spell. 
All right. Right. Um, but it's like a DC 17 save for the confusion spell. I mean, which that, is not nothing. That's not nothing. But again, if you are fighting Yanogu, I mean, he's a CR 24. Yeah, you should be able to get up in your save. But if you're not proficient in it, if it is not one of your saves, then you're... Or you're not trouble. hugging your paladin. Exactly. Which, um, friends, hug your paladin. Uh, the other ones are uh, just the DC 17 con save or be paralyzed. Oh, that's fun. Yep. No, uh, no, nothing makes me a little bit more terrified than being paralyzed in front of the thing that eats everything. Yeah, and the other thing is the uh, is you said before it's a it's a one d twelve yeah um, plus whatever you said nine, nine yeah um there the last one is an additional two d twelve damage <laughs> so I feel like at level twenty three d twelve doesn't hurt I mean it doesn't feel good but it's not gonna cripple you in a heartbeat like you're gonna survive yeah. a round or two yeah on these the problem is when you are the only melee fighter when you are the meat shield and you get hit by all three of these things because you may have con and you may have a shit ton of hit points but you probably don't have wisdom on top how many attacks does he get around with this thing uh i think i think the three with just multi just the three okay yeah so going toe-to-toe with it with this guy and so that's 1d12 Plus an effect. 1d12 plus an effect. 3d12 plus 9. This guy's called the Lord of Savagery, the Beast of Butchery. Like, he lives in a place called the Death Dells. If you're going toe-to-toe with him, you are either incredibly stupid or you have an ace up your sleeve. More than likely, you're just being incredibly stupid. Yes. Yeah. Um, Now, in the field, Knowles will apply several small tactics. Sure. I just want to talk about this generally right now. We'll talk about more specifics later. Um, They will go for the kill every single time. Um, There is no honor or mercy. They will target the easiest kills and work their way up in difficulty. Yes, but they've got super fucking low intelligence and entirely average wisdom, right? Uh, And and their charisma is low. Now, Mm -hmm. we're going to get into the stats and stuff. So the way they look at it is they target the guys without armor. Yeah. And then they will work and, up to the guys with and, armor. And the small guys. Right? Yeah. They want... This is not about reducing their numbers or weakening the enemy. This is about how many fucking kills do I get? This this is Legolas and Gimli's contest ramped up in a very brutal, uh, like, 300 way. Yeah. Right? Like, they are just there to kill. Basically, they av- uh But they will avoid projected battles because if a fight is too difficult... It will slow the slaughter to an unacceptable pace. Okay, so you mean like when when they see the army there, they're going to go, ah, fuck no, we'll, yeah. we'll do something else. And, the, and they'll That's what I about the, the walled fortress as well. Like they're yeah. gonna they're they're gonna hit the outlying farmlands and then go further down the road. Even if they're time. fairly certain they will win, the if it takes too long, a no will be like, oh, I mean, those will be easier to kill. Let's kill those. Yeah, right. So um, if they are. In a fight with stronger foes, they will swarm them. They understand the ideals of uh, the action economy, and even the most armored foes will fall to repeated blows. If a foe is behind a castle wall and the gnolls are committed to the fight, they will climb over their own dead to breach the defenses, sure, yeah. which we already mentioned. Um, they are constantly on the move. Uh, gnolls will never set roots. Once a sl- uh, slaughter is done, um, and the pack of hyenas that follow the gnoll band have eaten the dead and other gnolls alike, the gnolls will move on to their next kill. And those hyenas will then explode and become more gnolls. Exactly. And if at all possible, gnolls will weaken and kill from range first. This means that um, they will attack with their bows until you get up to them or get within charging range of them. And then they will uh, engage you in melee combat. I have I have some interesting thoughts about that I'll get into yeah. a little later. Um, this basically uh, translates to almost every single knoll having a bow and that they can use it with deadly efficiency. This is to weaken foes from uh, before a fight and to prevent any from escaping their dooms. Yeah. I find it's more them taking off stragglers than it is pre uh, emptying a fight. I have some thoughts. Yeah. Um, now, some of the more innovative knolls will even use burning arrows to start fires to rout their foes to a more advantageous locations. That is a, them. that has got to be about the most tactics that they're going to get. Yeah, and I, I and I honestly I feel like this is just that hunger of Yanogu 
speaks through them in this moment to give them these tactics. I don't think these are of their own source, right? Well, I also think that if that building is burning, then those people inside it will run out and then I can kill them. Yeah. It, it, and then eat them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, the one thing about Knowles is they are experts in camouflage and guerrilla tactics. Um, moving through the wilderness and ambushing any who happened too close to the rampaging wave of death. Okay? That was my nickname in college. Rampaging wave of death? Yep. How was jail? What? Me? You can never prove a damn thing, Dan. <laughs> it's not illegal if you get don't get caught, right? Oh, you can go ahead and get caught. It's not illegal if you don't get convicted. Anyways, the no language is guttural and dog-like. Um, they whine, cackle, and howl with rudimentary, and I love this, sign language to communicate across the warband. This will only help convey the most basic of concepts, as the knoll is more beast than humanoid. Locations of prey, cries for help, and the notifying a cache of weapons or armor are the limitations of their speech. I also like this because by the art, their hands are bigger than their heads. So they can actually like make hand movements and signals and stuff I, that are going to be easily seen from across a battlefield. I, I, I just, for the life of me, I... I feel like gnolls are doing like the SWAT hand signals a lot as well when they're sneaking through the woods. I don't know why I'm just stuck with this idea of like this gnoll with this little bow coming through and just like waving its hand, telling like a different squad to move ahead or something. In my head, it's a lot more brutal than that. Like they're holding up like the two fists put together and they're making a breaking noise to say, all right, go. Yeah. Like a like, uh, breaking motion rather to, to say go. Um, or they'll, they'll like hold up a, like pointed ears almost with two fingers on each hand for oh hey i can see elves or shit like that it's very very straightforward if you had sign language in a um let's say suddenly the world went deaf Mm -hmm. and there was no already established sign language what would we do to communicate our very basic needs yep that's what gnolls are doing it's going to be very rudimentary very body language focused kind of yeah. Uh, speech for sure now a no leader on the other hand who needs to com- communicate more complex plans does get a language and it's abyssal which feels a lot like this um blood of yanogu fueling them now there is a no language as well but it is just this rudimentary rudimentary um sign language and barks and whines right sure now in line with this uh limited communication the average knoll cares little for name or title um however the more advanced smarter knolls that lead the war bands may have names associated to them and these are usually the fangs which is a rank pack lords or even flins that yanogu himself gifts a name to so they don't come up with their own names they don't name themselves they kind of wait until yanogu gifts them a name yeah now, these can apply to a lot of non null cultists as well that also similarly please the Demon Lord. But the null naming convention is similar to Orcs. It's guttural with long vowels and hard consonants. Things like Argab, Orum, and Otal, Ushtar, and Ethak are some small examples. Okay? Now, for more info on perspective, like we mentioned earlier, um, go check out episode 43, which is Knowles, the Fast and the Furious. Nope. Furious. Fur- furious. Ugh. But Adam, is there anything else you want to mention about Knowles here before we move on? Um, so we, we said that these guys are like nine feet tall, but they stoop. Yeah. Right. They've got between huge... seven and nine feet tall. Yeah. Yeah. They've got these huge hands and this like lumbering gait to them. Um, it's weird that they gave us a half blind one as the picture in the monster manual. Yeah. It's got that like clouded eye. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the idea of that. The idea of them being scavengers and being born from hyenas, so they don't have like a, um, a society that they're coming from and whatnot, yeah. got me thinking, um, do they have genders? Does a knoll have a dick? I mean, on a string around its neck. Right, but are they smooth like a Ken doll? Um, honestly, I I don't see any purpose of them to have a weak spot in the middle of their body that can get hit in a battle. If they don't procreate, why would they? Because they're demon spawn and they and their entire life is to consume and then explode. Oh, they just into have a second mouth down there. No, like the movie no, I'm, I'm not going to say it's got little teeth. No, because that's another disturbing mental image that I think I saw in a movie once. But the... Old teeth. Yeah. Is that really? Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Gross. Anyways, now I'm having painful flashbacks. Um, the 
thing about that, I, I think you're right. I think they are Ken dolls. I, and I don't think they have gender. I don't think they care about gender. So we are trans friendly. On yes, this, of course. Right. Um, and uh, we've mentioned in, I think, the first Cobalt episode about how they can um, change genders. We know that elves, of course, um, are very androgynous. Yep. Um, and uh, and there are different ways that Fifth Ed looks at genders. I would, for pronouns for Knowles, use it. I would not go he's and she's. It'd be, I, oh, yeah. It'd be it's and, and they's. they's. Yeah. 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 Um, and that's, uh, and so it would be that, that gender neutral pronoun. The other, the other reason I would do this is because it gives Knowles specifically more of a unfamiliar, um, air about them. Not to say that like trans people are like that, but when, when you've got six or seven Knowles there and you're like, this one is doing that. It over here does that. Uh, these three, they are over there doing right. It, it distances them from your average NPC because if it's orcs, you're like, he's over there. She's doing this. They're over. Right. And so it's a little bit more, um, orcs feel civilized. Yeah. Compared to, compared to gnolls, orcs definitely do. And, and gnolls are just this, they are savagery. Yeah. Like they're not savages there because that's got a bunch of bad connotations, uh, especially here in Canada. Um, but, they they have this they they are savagery embodied they are demon spawn and we need to look at them more as demon spawn than um the player character races of past editions which knows have been player characters in fourth edition they're straight up not in fifth and that's why the the lore of them does not lend them to be player characters yeah so Anyway, just to just go back, I would really refer to every knoll as an it. Yep. Um, and remove the idea of of gender um, altogether. And it's not that these are asexual creatures by any means. They are absolutely non sexual. Like it's not yeah. like there's an absence of no. They don't. They don't have sex. You look at chromosome. They have X. Right. The, the, and then whatever fiendish nonsense. It, it, X it, and G. Yeah, right. <laughs> like like it, it's going to be its own thing. Um, and I in the past. The moment that your character, that your players name an animal, it becomes a pet. The moment that your goblin has a name, it becomes an NPC, right? The moment that the baker, um, if I talk about, oh, the baker in town does this and this and this. The moment I start to say he, they start to form ideas in their heads. Knowles should be forces of nature. Mm -hmm. So I keep them as objects, right? Uh, by using the pronouns be, um, in that way. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I just think it's a really interesting tool. I also tend to do that for undead and fiends and stuff. It's a really subtle way that I can manipulate the players and how they see this kind of creature. That being said, we're going to have a quick commercial before we reach out to our agents in the field as they report into the guild house here with breakdowns on their specific types of gnolls. Are you going to behave for this commercial? Almost certainly not. Why do I even bother with you? Why do you bother me? That's not what... Hey, everyone, and welcome to another stupid commercial that I don't want to fucking... Adam. Record. Daniel. Will you just... Please? Hi, everyone. It's that time again where... Thank God. Dan, I'm trying to record a commercial here. It's that time again where we remind you that we have a mailbag episode coming up soon. So if you have any questions, comments, or random thoughts for any of the hosts, please let us know. We actually really look forward to the mailbag episodes because it lets us talk directly with you guys, the listeners. NPCs. Most of the questions these days are directly related to D&D, &D, but you know we'll answer just about anything. Want to answer while you bother me? Stop it. You can send us direct messages through Instagram, find the post on the subreddit, or send us an email at info at .com. So the next time you're listening to an episode and struck with a quandary, perplexity, or bewilderment... Take a few seconds and type out a quick message for any one of the hosts. We'll make sure that your question gets added to the list. And also remember to enter our giveaways for a chance to have an entire episode dedicated directly to you. It's these interactions that bring the most joy to our lives. That and beer. What? You know what? We really should just get together to answer some questions one day and get drunk. Remember the time I showed up drunk for that one episode? Oh my god, I edited so much out of that one. This advertisement has been brought to you by Cirrhosis and Idiocy. Please drink responsibly. Don't tell me what to do. You're not my real dad, Dan.
So as I told Adam before recording here, we've do already done an episode on generic null lore, and they're kind of one note with this driving hunger to savagery. They've got their one thing and their one thing only. Until you get the different stat blocks and what we figure out by looking at the ins and outs of what they have to offer. So let's jump over to Brad first, who's going to give us the basic breakdowns of what we can expect from the majority of these chaotic, evil hyena men who he calls Null Warriors. Yeah, they're called Null Warriors in Volos when they're in the flavor text, but they're just Nulls and Yeah, they're just straight up yeah. Nulls. Yeah. Hello again, Brad checking in here from the Yawning Portal. Just a little update for you here, as I've been talking to some adventures passing through, I've been chatting to them about uh, gnolls and their counterparts. Got some interesting information. We're going to start off with some gnoll warriors here for you. Um, gnoll warriors are kind of, they make up the core of a uh, gnoll warband. There's nothing really special about them per se, but they are kind of the bread and butter, the big meat bulk of a warband. Uh, they generally tend to fight with spears made from whatever they can find, but they like to use sticks, bone, rocks, things like that, but especially bone. And they aren't necessarily blessed by Yonogu, but they're ferocious, they're vicious, and they are dangerous, and you need to watch out for them, especially in packs. Uh, Gnolls themselves are above average most uh, strength, dex, and con. While not particularly intelligent, they're wise enough to get by about as wise as a human um and definitely not very charismatic i mean these guys are generally drooling at the mouth they're vicious they're ferocious they don't rely on charisma they rely on their strength and their decks to get them by um with an ac of 15 these things are not pushovers they're fast they move quickly and they tend to wear uh, light hide armor so they are decently well protected some of them even carry a shield with their spear gnolls tend to have dark vision that's kind of a norm for them the thing that surprised me most about gnolls is their movement speed. They don't actually have any additional movement. Their speed is 30. That's it. You'd think for, you know, some sort of pack animal or dog, but walking on two legs, they have the same movement as pretty much any other medium-sized creature. They have a special ability called Rampage. Um, whenever they reduce someone to zero hit points using a melee attack, they can take a bonus action to then move half their speed and make a bite attack. So basically, if they take you down, they're going to look for the next closest target, and they get to move and make an attack again. Uh, their main attacks, they can make a bite attack, which counts as a melee weapon attack. Plus four to hit on that, and it does 1d4 plus two damage. So not a lot, but if you get enough of these, these things are going to take you down. Uh, they also carry the spear, or sometimes a longbow. So with the spear, they can make a melee or a ranged attack with it. With a plus four to hit in a range of 20 to 60 feet. It does 1d6 plus two piercing damage, or... 1d8 plus 2 if used as a two-handed attack. They also sometimes carry a longbow, which they can make a ranged weapon attack with. Plus 3 to hit on that. A range of 150 to 600 feet, which is standard for a longbow. And they do 1d8 plus 1 damage, which is also standard for a longbow. Now, gnolls tend to not travel alone. Fairly often, it's very common for them to travel with hyenas in their pack. Hyenas themselves, they have pretty close to an average strength, a higher dexterity, an okay constitution, no intelligence. These aren't intelligent creatures. Uh, they are, being pack animals, they are wise, um, and obviously not very charismatic. They're still animals. Basically, this special, their attack, they have a bite attack that uh, they have plus two to hit, and it does 1d6 damage. Uh, but the main thing for them is they have pack tactics, uh, and just like all other pack tactics, basically they can attack with advantage if they have an ally within five feet of the creature that they are attacking. All that being said, they are dangerous creatures, both gnolls and hyenas when you fight them in packs. Individually, yeah, they aren't much to worry about. You'll probably pick them off pretty easily. But these guys don't travel alone. They, rarely you'll find one, one hyena or one gnoll, and if you do, be wary because there's a very good chance that they're either out there as an Per, uh, bait for an ambush, or they've just stepped away and their friends are only a step or two behind them. Maybe you're looking at a scout. I really like to use both of these, especially in large numbers, especially in numbers so large that the party really isn't going to be able to deal with them very easily. They're going to need to recruit, they're going to need to come up with ambush plans. These things travel in such large packs and such large war bands that you're not likely going to be able to attack either gnolls or their hyena companions head on. You're going to need to either draw some out in smaller groups and take them down one pack at a time, or you're going to need to find some other way of getting around it. 
I feel that at low level, yeah, gnolls and the hyenas, they make for a formidable challenge. But if you're going to use them at high levels, make them more of an environmental hazard. Um, I know Adam, Dan, and Terry have talked about this in the past, but a big wandering warband is terrifying. No matter what level your party is, they should be wary of a pack of hyenas or gnolls together. They're a formidable opponent and used in numbers, which they should be. They are not to be scoffed at. I think that's about all I have to say on gnolls and hyenas. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, maybe talk about how you've used them or how any ideas you would have for using them, you can reach out to me on Instagram at Clueless Game Master or give me a mention on the subreddit and I tend to poke my head in there once in a while and I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, Dan and Adam, back to you guys. So this is going to be something that comes up a lot. If you've listened to the past, what is it, seven episodes now? This is something we've said, I'm pretty sure every single episode. No, not everyone, but most of them. Most of them. Your AC is going to be different when you are wielding a shield and when you are wielding a longbow. It's 15 yeah. with the shield, with the shield. Yeah, the moment that you pull at the longbow, it Your becomes AC's 13, 13 right? Yeah. You do lose the shield. You have to keep that in mind and this has got to be some of the flavor that you can add as a dungeon master says he puts down the longbow, he slings the longbow over shoulder, picks up a shield and charges forward. Yeah. Right? Or you you run at him and you catch him with the longbow, he drops the longbow, grabs the shield and then fights you, right? Yeah. So this is going to really give more of an impression of what uh, of what these monsters have to offer. But I mean, AC thirteen is real weak for CR half. It is, but I don't think that you're really getting into AC thirteen fights with gnolls, right? Though they will be shooting from a distance, like you said, and then when they close that gap, that shield comes out. Yeah, right. And so you may get one attack in at thirteen. And they got a pile of hit points. Like that's no, it, it, it's going to be your quick monk. It's going to be your barbarian. It's going to be uh, your rogue who makes sure to dash during that bonus action that gets up to them. Right? It's not right. Good. But the moment they get up there, all of the gnolls will now pick up that shield and charge. Right? And that shield is probably going to be this beat up hunk of wood that they just so happen to have a handhold on. Like this thing isn't going to be some in- incredibly intricate. There may be some that picked up off of fallen soldiers. Maybe, yeah. But, like, remember, uh, Knoll's equipment, their entire... Like, they don't maintain their equipment. Let's be I completely also, honest. I also like this. Knoll's are great. Sorry, just as a sidebar. Mm-hmm. When you get a magic item that you can kind of scry and sense where it might be, and, oh, we know it's over, it's to the west somewhere, but it keeps fucking moving, it could just be that magic sword is picked up by Knoll's, and you don't have to go get it from the Knoll's. Oh, that would be hilarious. The prophetic, you know... The, the one actual sword that can kill the Tarask in one hit or whatever it is, right? So. Yeah. Oh, you could even go a different route with that and saying, like, it, there's a important gem inside of an item, inside of the hilt of a sword, yeah. right, that they've picked up. Anyways, uh, so anyways, is mentioning that they get 60 feet of dark vision even worth it at this point? Everybody gets Everybody? dark vision. It's always 60 e- feet. Except for Dragonborns, I, there's... which pisses me off. Yep. So, um, at least Tritons get it now, but... That took four books to give it to them. Yeah, but, like, honestly, no, these guys have 60 feet dark vision. Again, gnolls are going to attack at night. They will have the advantage when they do that shit. Mm -hmm. Um, Ideally, honestly, it comes down to to dim light. That is the ideal time for gnolls to be hunting. I, I, I know what, I would disagree with you here, but also agree with you in a certain way. Gnolls... Will attack when gnolls attack. If you so happen to cross their path, it's cool. But if you are keeping, like, if you come across their path in the middle of the day, they're going to draw weapons and attack you. If you set up a fire in knoll country for a camp at night, they will find you and attack you at night as well. Like I said, they don't rest. They don't sleep. They're just constantly moving. So this just enables them to be deadly at all hours of the day. So, Adam, they do have this Rampage ability, which is beautiful, and I love it. How does that uh, influence role-playing with these guys? The idea that when something dies, they go into a bit of a, a blood frenzy. Yep. The idea of it rampaging, it's it's counterintuitive to me. The way that it should work in my head, because these guys need to consume, is if I drop... If my character drops... Um, like, my Noel character drops a, a player to zero hit points, then all of the other gnolls should descend upon that player and eat them. 
Mm -hmm. instead of then ignoring the body and moving on to the next one. Uh, Right? Because they, they are there for that consumption. So there has to be some limited amount of intelligence that says, I have to clear out all the threats first. Yes. Right? That's not really implied anywhere else, the fact that the gnolls can prioritize threats um, in a very specific way. When we look at them being able to rampage, when they can move that that distance. Yep. Which, again, is going to be like another 15 feet, and then they get that bite attack. Well, I mean, honestly, most battlefields have the 15 feet, right? But, yep. um, like, your players are going to be hunched together. They tend to be, especially when one of them goes down and everyone's running forward with the healing potions and healing spells and yep. shit like that. So, um, so your gnolls, but like, if they're intelligent enough to be able to see what the dangers are, are they going to be smart enough to um, figure out that a golem, for example, or animated armor is not a real threat or doesn't help them? If we kill the wizard, that thing will drop, right? Like, how do you how do you play the level of intelligence when it comes to... See, Rampage gives me the idea that they can prioritize, but their intelligence is, what, six? Yeah. It's fucking weak. So they're like just above beast with yeah. their intelligence. Um, so the way I, the way I play this is um, again, they will go from the weakest appearing targets to the most, right? So a golem, like you mentioned, doesn't appear weak. A flesh golem might. Uh, I mean, yes and no, because they're still going to be big. They're still going to be bulky, right? They're, so the way I view this is this guy's down. And we know he's down, right? He's on the ground, he, labor breathing. We're going to move on to the next thing. Well, yeah, but it's, so, it, it's interesting to me too because it's not a kill. It's just unconscious, right? You'd think they'd go for the kill. Um, yeah, like, right? Like, it just doesn't quite feel right, does it? It No, you're right. It doesn't. I'm The more I think about it, because like we mentioned earlier, gnolls go in for the kill. That's what they do. So my suggestion is to show this rampage um, ability early by having a handful of no-name NPCs between you guys and the gnolls mm -hmm. so that they will go. Because remember, a commoner has four fucking hit points and an AC of what, 10? Yeah. Right? What What are these guys doing on average with their with their attacks? Oh, uh, five hit points. Right. Yeah, five, five damage. damage. Yeah. Right? So they should, and that's average, they should be able to one hit kill. So kill one, hit hit the next, kill that one, right? Like, And they're doing four with a bite. Yeah, so they should be there. One of these guys should just be able to go person to person to person to person all the way through in this. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of how I like to frame um, my, how tough my monsters are. Can they kill you? And Can they kill a commoner in one hit? Can a commoner kill them in one hit? Right? So the way I kind of view this, uh, now that I've been thinking about it for a couple seconds here, is that front wave of gnolls, the front line of gnolls is going to run forward. They're going to drop things. And then, yeah, they're going to leave the thing on the ground and move on. Because they're the kill is, or the slaughter is by far the more important thing to them. But they go forward and the gnolls in the back will then eat. Because this is an attack, this is an ability to go from this thing that you've just dropped to another target to start attacking that one right away. Well, it's interesting that you say that because as we go throughout this episode, we're going to see that there are multiple waves of gnolls and they're built to come in waves, yeah, strangely. Right. Um, also, Brad's right about the hyenas um, being, you know, pushovers. They're not fucking difficult. No. Right. If you run into one hyena, it's, I mean, it's CR zero for a reason. AC of 11, 1d8 plus one hit points. So an average of seven hit points. No, six hit points. No, no five no. hit points. Yeah, five hit points. Um, and uh, <laughs> that's some good math you just did there. Um, but they've got a better passive perception. Yep. I mean, they're dogs. Well, they're not, but sure. Um, they're canine. But they're not, so sure. Not technically. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, the idea here that they've got this passive perception to be able to hunt things down um, there's a reason that the gnolls keep the hyenas around, not just to boost up their numbers, but actual hunting. And with 50 feet of movement per round, that's fucking incredible. Yeah. Right. You talk about your wave one, wave one is hyenas and hyenas are going to come in and they're going to tie you up with pack tactics and arrows. 
hyenas and arrows. Yep. Um, and remember, those pack tactics means that their plus two to hit really acts like a plus six. Like we had, like yeah, talked well, about the, with, the, with the, the advantage from last week. Right? Yeah, yeah. We, we discussed last week that the um, probability of advantage basically translates to a plus four to hit. Yeah, it's more complicated than that. I actually dropped a thing on the subreddit about uh, advantage, which is a little bit more in depth. What you can expect. Um, as what you didn't want to do advanced probability calculations on Mike? Uh, I I actually fucking pitched that at Dave, and he told me to leave it alone. Thank you, Dave. So Dave, um, I owe you a beer. <laughs> so um, I I really like the idea of hyenas, but. Hyenas don't provide pack tactic opportunities. So if you're not playing with flanking rules, then the gnolls don't get any benefit from the hyena being there. Mm. However, if you are playing with with um, flanking rules, with flanking rules, what the fuck is the point of a hyena just put another gnoll in there? Uh, honestly, the way I see the hyenas is they are there to fill out the encounter. So like you're gonna uh, build, you're gonna build out a like. You got a party of level two characters. You're going to want, you know. I understand the idea of encounter balance and it is important. And I've got a lot of thoughts about it. However, I build encounters on lore and then warn you guys when it's going to be too tough of a fight. Yeah. If you go in there anyway, you will find a deadly fight. So if it's, I will just build, if the hyenas don't make any fucking sense, there will not be hyenas to round out a battle. <sighs> yes. Okay. I'm with you. Lore-wise, having hyenas with a warband of gnolls makes sense. But lore-wise, the hyenas come in afterwards. They're not front round. True. Well, yeah, I, I could see what you're saying there. So I just... They're not going to be as super beneficial as as they could be oh. if they were granting pack tactics as well. Here's what I'm thinking. Uh-oh. Buckle um, the fuck up. Buckle the fuck up because Dan has a thought. Um, the, the squirrel started running. The gnolls drop the victims... And the hyenas jump on the dropped victims to start the consumption. So they're but, in the midst of the war band. They, they, but, but, but again, because I don't, I don't, I don't see them organized by like rank. But you I don't, don't see them need like, fucking pack tactics then because your guy is already prone. You're getting advantage on the attack. They have pack tactics because they're closely tied with wolves in that. And, and, and wolves have pack tactics too. I understand that. I just don't think it's a perfect setup. I'm trying to find a way to get hyenas in the mix mm -hmm. to make it a little bit scarier than just these three gnolls. Yeah. One of them, it's got a shield. The other two are using longbows. Anyways, Megan is going to be up next here with a creative way to pronounce Yanogu. <laughs> oh, man. These, these fucking made up words are just, they're lovely. The worst. They're the absolute worst. Anyways, we're going to get to see a regular theme in 5th edition that shows the hierarchy in stat blocks. Orcs and war chiefs, goblins and bosses, hobgoblins and warlords, so on. Now we're going to move on with that. Let's see what a null pack lord looks like. Hey guys, thanks so much for reaching out to me here at the Castle Ravenloft. This, of course, is Megan here. So I'm going to get this out of the gate right here. Um, I'm not a huge fan of gnolls. I feel like out of the pack mentality hordes that you can utilize within your campaigns, gnolls aren't necessarily my personal favorite. However, when I was reading this, I thought it was kind of cute. So I thought I would uh, give you guys some a little bit more of a detail on them. So today I want to talk to you guys about the gnoll pack lord, which seems pretty simple. And honestly, they are pretty simple. So just like any other self-respecting pack, you will kind of have a leader. So these guys are, of course, you're, you're, they call themselves the Null Pack Lord, and it's not very creative. Again, they're not exactly the, the smartest horde mentality style group you can have, but cute nonetheless. So these guys are considered to be the champions of their god, Yinogu, which is n not exactly your most brightest and happiest god. Think like living sacrifices, blood, demonic symbols, all that whole good, good wholesome feelingness is basically what you're going to get out of um, this group of folks. So you can kind of pick the pack lord out of a crowd of these because they kind of tend to adorn themselves with bloodstained furs. Of course, the demonic sigils I was talking about, um, kind of like if they have like a ton of skin tattoos, they of course are covered in piercings. They also like to carry like the largest weapon they possibly can. So think like giant Viking axe or something to that nature. 
So honestly, if you're thinking visual, think of the most goth heavy metal band lead singer you can, and that would be your Null Pack Lord. But let's dig into a stat block here. So these guys here, they do have an armor class of 15. They do wear armor. Um, and here it says chain shirt, but I can imagine probably just be a body full of piercings. Um, they've got a good heavy set of hit points. So um, on average 49, or you can roll your 98 plus 9. And they've got a general speed of 30 feet. So these guys' challenge rating is about a two. These guys are going to be pack a bigger punch than just your regular knoll. So they do, of course, have... They, you can tell they're built to be fighters. So they have a strength of 16 and a dex of 14 and a constitution of 13. So, of course, their strengths lie more on that physical embodiment as opposed to the mental capacity. So, of course, their intelligence is a, an eight, their wisdom an 11, and their charisma is a nine. I feel like they do have a slightly higher charisma or their intelligence because they are leaders within their pack. Therefore, they do have to definitely have that ability to either be intimidating or just have that perception of how to manage a battlefield, right? So, of course, their senses being a null, they have their dark vision, they have their passive perception. They only speak null. So I, I think we've talked about this before, but these guys probably aren't going to be wanting to have a conversation with you. And should you try it's probably not going to work very well just because of their lower intelligence and the fact that they don't tend to speak other languages. So in my mind, this does not fall into the same kind of concept of talk to your hordes. This is something completely different. So much like other gnolls, they of course have their rampage ability. So this is kind of like the fact that when they, when they reach zero hit points, with a melee attack, uh, they can use a bonus action to move up to half its speed. So basically um, get out of there and of course make their bite attack. So it is like a, a last ditch effort to retreat and like maim. And then for general actions, they do have their multi attack. So these guys do get two attacks either with their glaive or their long bow or use its ability to rampage if it can. So they do also have the ability to bite, which I mentioned, which is technically a melee weapon attack. It is a plus five to hit. Um, with a 1d4 plus 3 for piercing damage, which is pretty good. Their glaive, of course, is their giant weapon, or in my mind, you could use a giant axe or something larger to, you know, fill the void of it being a null pack lord. And that is, of course, a melee weapon with a plus 5 to hit and a 1d10 plus 3 slashing damage. So, of course, they're not too overpowering attack-wise, but again, if you're getting two hits in before you move on, and then if it decides to use its rampage, it can get pretty dicey depending on the level of your team. They do have a longbow, so they can use a ranged weapon. Uh, it is only a plus four to hit, but they do have quite a long distance of 150 feet up to 600 feet um, with disadvantage. So these guys can see and hit from a pretty far distance. And it is a 1d8 plus 2 piercing damage. So a pretty strong hit if you were going to get hit by one of these arrows. And then, of course, as I said, they can incite their rampage. So basically how it works for the insight rampage is that it does recharge on a 5 or 6. So basically one creature that this knoll can see within 30 feet of itself um, can actually use its reaction to make a melee attack if, if it can hear its basic war cry, right? So I can. this is your pack mentality that these guys have. Uh, and I think it's kind of neat, of course, if you've got a bunch of gnolls just howling on a battlefield, which I think is kind of cute. So personally, I am kind of in love with the general aesthetic of the gnoll pack lord. Uh, I feel that they would not really want to converse with people for very long. As I mentioned, they don't really have the language and intelligence capacity to hold a conversation. So, and I actually imagine them being rather impatient. Like, I would want to implement one of these in a game just as someone to really piss off your fighter or be put into a battle of the gods against your paladin. So, as I said, these guys are very, very much held in high regard for their god, so I could see them seeing a paladin as being extremely offensive and actually being the person that they go after first. So if you're thinking pack mentality, who fights what first, I feel like if there is a holy character on the grounds, I feel like this knoll would go for that person first. <laughs> and I just, I love the imagery now in my head of, I also feel like, even though I know that this isn't necessarily probably what would happen in my mind, this is what would happen. I feel like these Knoll pack lords have a respect for other pack lords, almost like if they were in their own little Jeep club. So if they see each other on a battlefield or they're from different packs, but they happen to see each other from across the way, they'll give each other like a, a head nod and like a thumbs up and then move along their way. <laughs> I don't know. I just like that imagery in my head of these badass goth looking scary blood covered guys just giving each other a respectful head nod on the battlefield <laughs> um i can also imagine that they're not the kind of fighter to kind of stand back and use their longbow so i know they have it just for 
like, you know, battlefield mentality. If they want to be able to hit someone from a distance, they can. But I can see these people just taking an arrow out of their satchel and then running up and stabbing someone in the eye instead of actually using the bow for its intended purpose or using the bow as a blunt weapon as opposed to actually utilizing it as it should be from a distance. I feel like these guys like to be in the thick of the battle to cover themselves and the blood of their enemies, shall we say. But anyways... I have to get back. Uh, we are actually deciding to open the door on this weird hidden room slash tomb that we found last week. So fingers crossed it's something neat, but I'm going to throw it back to you guys. But before I do, if anybody wants to follow me personally on Instagram, you can at at zero mega zero. Um, but back to you, Adam, Dan. Okay, so their AC 15 doesn't rely on a shield, so there's no penalty to using a longbow. So I feel like they're going to use a longbow longer. And also, do you think that with the Insight Rampage ability and the Longbow, they're going to sit back and bark orders? Pun intended. You're the worst. But no, really, like, these pack lords are, as much as they are driven by the same hunger for mm-hmm. slaughter and whatnot, don't you think that they are going to to be, they've got better hit points, right? Um, their glaive gives them a 10-foot reach, right? It, I get the impression that this creature isn't necessarily going to be face-to-face with the enemy, Unless they have to be. They're going to be sitting back and picking them off with bows. They're going to be inciting because everyone within 30 feet. It makes more sense for them to be in the middle of the pack, right? Which is not where the enemies are. The enemies are going to be at the outskirts of the pack because the moment the pack catches up with them, it stops, right? So okay. so I feel like lore-wise, this pack lord is going to be in there toe-to-toe with them. But mechanics-wise, it's advantageous for them to not be. I don't think gnolls are tactical enough thinkers to do that, though. What, so, what's so, the wisdom score on this? Because that's where we get 11, our tactics. 11. Well, I mean, that's average. That's a human being. I, I, if I can figure it out, a pack lord should. They're also, they've also got an 8 int. Like, they're not, they're dumb. But they're not as dumb as the average gnoll. Well, and again, they're unlearned. Yeah, right? So, I... I I see what you're saying, but at the same time, like, they are just as driven by this hunger, and it's any knoll within 30 feet of it can use this reaction, so I have a feeling this guy's going to want to be around as many knolls as possible, which means he's going to be in the thick of things. Right, but I'm looking at my actual D&D battle map where I have eight or nine knolls, right, that are going to be in any given fight, and they're going to spread out. Those three are going to be fighting the barbarian, that one is hunting down the wizard, these guys over here are going toe-to-toe with the monk. Right, and so there should be one roughly in the middle who is breaking down, or who is trying to trigger this over and over and over again, yeah. and getting these distances. And I again, I think he's only five feet behind one of them, but it's enough that yeah. he can hit with the glaive or shoot that guy over there that's about to go down. Well, let's be completely honest when you when you're laying out your battle maps here and and you and you're describing to your players what kind of encounter they're about to have, you're going to have you know six or seven gnolls all wearing leather armors and put together random pieces of armor but um like strapped together hides and rough broken down shields with half you know, a rude spears know. and stuff yeah. like that and then you have this one dude with a glaive and a chain shirt yeah right like he's got the best gear he's got he's, the best gear and he's the one that's howling and barking and j- he's the one sitting there with the glaive in one hand and the other hand is giving these these hand signal movements right yeah Clearly the leader still doing a shit ton of damage, but he's not going to get like right up into the mix of it because he's managing it. We, we say that when they know that they're not going to win, they will move on to another target. At some point, they're going to retreat. Do you like the idea that a pack lord will direct the gnolls to kill clerics and, and the, the faithful people first because they're an affront to Yanogu? I'm not a huge fan personally because I don't think that level of thought goes that far. I don't think it necessarily does either. However, I think they'll target um, people that are worshipping Baphomet. Oh, they'll like go out of their way to kill a Minotaur? Yes, yeah. absolutely. They will hunt yeah. down a Minotaur. They they will not just, like, they'll kill a horse. They will string up a bull, mm-hmm. right? Like I, anything that's like that. If they walk up to the tavern and they've got those big like steer horns up above the door and shit, that place will burn. Right? I mean that like, place is likely to burn anyways, but that'll burn sooner. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so I so I think that's kind of the trigger. I I they don't like magic as a general rule. Mm-hmm. They're not they're not all about the divine casters. 
but demon lords are not gods, right? This is not yeah. this is not um, a Groomsh versus Maglubiate, right? That's, yeah, that's not what we're dealing with. They're here. patrons. They're patrons. They're just they're super powerful warlords, right? And that's a step down with godlike powers, but they're not gods. God, yeah. They they do not get powers based on prayer. No, no, definitely not. They get powers based off circumstance. So they don't give a fuck what that guy's praying about. No skin off his back, right? Like, who gives a shit? Let's go. Rip the skin off his back. Well, in this case, yes. Yeah. Um, anyway, so in Volos, there's another kind of knoll that at first glance seems very similar to the basic knoll that Brad was talking about. Um, we're, we've gone to Tyler, who has a little bit more personal experience with these guys. Let's see what he has to say. Glad I got a hold of you guys. Not too long ago, I was talking to you guys about kobolds. Now, early the next morning, my goblin companion and I left for our travels. But a couple hours out, we noticed a little bit of movement. Uh, what? What? Yeah, fine, fine. Yes, my goblin companion noticed the movement, and I saw it after he informed me. Now, are you happy now? Yeah? All right then, fine. Now, being in the waste here can be dangerous, so we immediately stopped and laid down on the ground behind some bushes nearby. Now, I put my spyglass together to have a better idea of what we were seeing. In the distance where the movement was, I happened to see a creature moving stealthily through the wilderness. Now, at first, I couldn't tell, but I recognized it as a knoll. Nasty little things they are, but I'm sure you've already learned a little bit about them. This specific one, though, was a little different than your average knoll, as it was hard to track. Also, it was wearing a different kind of armor. It looked like a leather armor rather than a hide armor. Now, I had to guess, then, that this was a knoll hunter. These guys are interesting because instead of sticking to the pack, they usually either skike off any prey straggling by themselves to make the main f attack force all that much more lethal, or they run behind the pack picking off any gnolls that are injured or too tired to keep up with the rest. Now these guys are the reason you don't see too many already wounded gnolls heading into battle, and also the reason why you don't want to be splitting up your force too much when these guys are around. They will pick you off. Now if they don't care about stealth and they see a smaller group nearby, they will blow a horn that they have attached to them, and it sounds similar to a banshee cry, which is already scary enough. But before we continue, let's look at their stats in comparison to, let's say, a regular knoll. We can see right now, right away, that their armor is a little different, because a knoll usually has a hide armor and a shield, but not the not the hunters. They only have a leather armor, so the AC is dropped to 13. Now their hit points is just 4d8 plus 4 instead of the regular 5d8. Now their overall stats is where the hunter tends to be a little better. Their strength is the only thing that stays the same. Other than that, they have a bit higher dex. Their constitution is a bit higher, they're a bit smarter too. And their wisdom, as well, is a bit higher. And their charisma, pretty close to the same, but they're just a little bit more charismatic. Pretty much everything is bumped up a couple points. But their skills, they have a plus three to perception and a plus four to stealth. These are stealthy buggers, they're the ones you don't see. Now, their dark vision, again, 60 feet and their passive perception is 13. Now the challenge rating again stays the same as a regular null. Now for the actions they have a bite, a spear, and a longbow just like a regular null except these guys have a multi-attack. They can attack twice with their spear or fire two shots with their longbow. And the ammunition they use guys is not your average ammunition. Their arrows are barbed. That means if it hits you, well, it might have a chance because they get a plus four to hit. Whoever it hits, their speed is reduced by ten feet until the end of their next turn. That means if you get hit, you're not running away from these guys. They're going to catch up to you first. Now, as you can see, they're not overall that different from your regular knoll, other than a bit more powerful and with their multi-attacked and barbed arrows. 
But their true strength is not in combat, but the potential before combat even happens. Who's to say these guys travel alone? Maybe there are more than just one scouting ahead in the same spot. You might spend all your time tracking one, thinking they're easy pickings, we're gonna get this guy easy. And then you don't even realize the other two that are scouting ready to pounce. Oh, so it's like in Jurassic Park. <laughs> Clever girl. So be careful not to assume they are alone. Which is precisely why my companion and I stayed low for a few days in the same spot until we saw the entire pack pass by. We heard the screams of the kobolds as the gnolls stormed the tower we had just stayed in. Who knows if these guys are still around now. But I want to tell you guys before we moved out. Now you guys can find me at Melodica's Music on Instagram and on Facebook. Now just remember, adventure... What, what do you say? You said, did you say there's another one close by? Crap, stay down. Why is it that Tyler always seems to be in some kind of trouble? Have you met him? <laughs> like, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, look, I think it's safe to say that Knoll Hunters are more likely to hang back and rely on their bows for the most part. Oh, yes. Um, especially considering the nasty type of barbaras that they're using that give them the better offensive capabilities. And they've also got lower hit points, right? Do you remember when we were kids and uh, our local government here uh, banned the barb on a fishing hook? Oh, yeah. And, like, we were in Boy Scouts. We went fishing all the time. Yeah. Right? Like, that was big news way back in the day. Like, but there was always that one asshole that just, like, committed. Like, no, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm still used barbed. Yeah. What, what, what are they going to do? Find me? And yeah. Then, like... Right? So, um, I I imagine the Knoll, like, the Knoll Hunters are kind of like that. They're just all, like, we need the most jagged, savage piece of metal to slap on an arrow. I, and I feel like even if they have a regular normal arrow, they're going to sit there and hold it in the fire until it gets soft enough that they can beat it against another piece of metal to make it jagged. Yep. I really, really like these barbed arrows. I think yep. that's a lot of fun to slow people down. Mm -hmm. um, and this is why I put Hunters at the back. Yes. Not at the front. Um, as much as they're there to, um, to like slow down the, the people that are escaping, they've got an average movement. Like these guys, gnolls will hunt you the fuck down. Yeah. Honestly, I think it's like, you'll have your front wave of gnolls, which will have a couple hyenas intermixed there. Um, then you will have the no pack Lord, uh, but who's barking orders, who's barking orders and joining the fray. Um, but on the outskirts of the clearing hidden amongst the trees because we did mention earlier that gnolls are masters of camouflage and yep. guerrilla tactics you got these assholes circling the battle to make sure that there is no escape yeah and i think that that's more likely to like the cavalry here has got range yes exactly um it's also interesting to point out that it doesn't say the reduced speed effect of their longbow doesn't stack yeah when it hits it reduces it by 10 feet what happens you get hit by more than one? Ah, uh, I mean, you have five of these guys and you just hit a, a hot rolling streak and now your monk is just pinned to the ground. But why the fuck not? If you are hit by these massive fucking scary arrows. No, and I'm on board. The, the fact that I can't do the Robin Hood grapple a dude against a tree with an arrow. Yeah. And so like, I like this for flavor because there's no penalty for then removing the arrow or getting more speed next round. There's no save involved for this mm. so just fucking pin them down i think it's really crazy because now you've got to go rescue those characters those npcs or players who got pinned by the fucking knoll my problem is if if a knoll is using this thing and it's just a it's not a magical weapon yeah it is a barbed arrow yep when the battle's done and your players are victorious and the fanfare has done and the bard is singing his song of rest and the barbarian is going around picking up these arrows do these arrows uh maintain that trait can the barbarian then use this with a longbow to slow a fleeing uh goblin in tomorrow's session yes by 10 feet yes absolutely because you have a 50 50 chance of being able to pick up or no sorry you have to roll to recover 50 percent of your arrows yes so this is going to dwindle quickly this is going to end up in the ranger's repertoire yeah and they're going to hold on to it because when do they need to use this? So then, yes, this will become 
an item that they can use later. I yeah. like that. Yeah, I and, like it too. And they're not going to stack round after round after round because you've got your action economy. All of these Null Hunters are shooting all at once as opposed to your Ranger, which just shoots three times with them, the yeah. crazy attack. True, but if you have an archery-focused fighter, that dude's not going anywhere. This is Sentinel yeah, no, okay. range. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> then again, if you have an archery-focused um, uh, fighter, he's got other ways because he's probably an arcane archer. That's true, too. Okay, so with the flavor lore of the hunter picking off and killing other gnolls, I mean, I think it's safe to say that uh, that they don't have clerics or healers with them. Uh, no, gnolls heal by consuming enough that they explode and become a new gnoll. Gnolls don't become new gnolls. Hyenas become new gnolls. I don't, I, I don't see why gnolls becoming new gnolls couldn't be a thing. Because it's not in the lore, Dan. Um, uh, it's not not in the lore. If oh. hyenas could do it, why okay. can't gnolls do it? Uh, all right, sure, but... Like, how is a flind actually made? From a very large alpha hyena. That is how I would do that. I would absolutely do it that way. Otherwise, the gnolls would just be eating each other until there's one massive gnoll that could fight Ianagu. Uh, the gnolls can't get stronger by eating. No, but I, they can rejuvenate in a way, right? Like, I, a gnoll that has reached the end of its life cycle and hasn't died will go through the same just I don't think that's ever happened. <laughs> no, that's, that's true, too. So, right? um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I just don't see... I don't see Knoll's healing. I think that you should... No, you're right. I don't either. Yeah. Um, there's no healing magic involved. They're not doing medicine checks on each other. They don't carry potions. They, they rely on their rests. And they only rest once they've eaten intelligent flesh. And gorged on it, right? Yeah. This so is that's actually... Their, this is going to be good healing. for players as well. If you harry a larger warband that if you did a full attack on um, and just start whittling them down, you know you could take a rest, but they're going to keep moving. Right. Um, so eventually you might be able to wear them down if you manage to work it out in some way. All right. One more question, though, about sure. the, the hunters. Um, so this is the same CR rating as, an, as a regular knoll, right? Yep. Regular knoll. Regular knoll. When you are your average knoll and you have your ability to pick up the shield and, um, and your CR half within your knoll hunter... Doesn't get the AC bonus, but gets this offensive thing. They're both the same CR. Do you sit there and say which one is stronger? Like, if I'm going to put seven of these, of both of these, the seven will turn into a CR four, but these ones will stay as a CR three. No. Like, do you ever sit there and compare the two similar CRs against each other and say every CR is a spectrum? Some are stronger, some are weaker. Um, Because the fucking multi-attack. I Yeah, I mean, the multi-attack does kind of way into things but the, honestly the way i i what is that creatures what is that thing's role and how does it perform in that role is kind of how i look at it so like a hunter although it is the same cr as a normal knoll a normal knoll is going to want to be in melee and hunter isn't but the hunter only is like missing one hit die and two ac and otherwise is superior in every way like if yeah, one hit die for these guys is a lot like that that that's twenty percent of their health. That's fine. Right, but when you're dealing with mobs, I'm not talking about when you're fighting a, a level three party. I'm talking about when you're fighting a level eight party. I'm gonna look to hunters before I look at a regular knoll. I just am. Because you with their range ability, that makes them so much more powerful because they're not taking damage. Uh yeah. I mean, when the difference is that little bit of of And at that point, like one D eight or or four hit points means nothing. Yeah. Right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pick the hunter out of Volos over the Knoll out of the Monster Manual for my standard minion stat block at higher levels, even though it has lower. At AC. higher levels, yes. Um, my only problem is, um, not, uh, yeah. I guess I guess I do do what you said because I'm sitting here <laughs> do do. Yeah, um, do do. <laughs> I I I'm sitting here going if you have a bunch of that slowing ability that the hunters have with their barbed arrows. That is going to get exponentially worse the more hunters there are. Right. So that at higher levels, when you've got 12 of these hunters, yeah. you're pinning a party down. You really are. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I, I see what you're saying. Anyways, so one of the fun things about Knowles is that not every member of the pack is a humanoid or a beast. The next kind of Knoll is an undead horror that Dave recently ran across on Eberron. In Eberron. In Eberron. The worst. 
Uh, hey, Adam. Dan. Dave here. Uh, so, I've actually made my way up here to the Aldine Reaches. I'm looking for someone in particular in my quest to figure out this draconic prophecy. Um, I'm not quite sure where this guy is, but maybe maybe I'll find him next time. But uh, let me tell you, getting here was nuts. We ran into, I mean, I'm sure you can figure it out, gnolls. But not just regular gnolls, like there were a bunch of different kinds, but the ones that really kind of freaked me out the most were these uh, these, these witherlings, I think they're called. Uh, as you guys know, the gnoll warbands, I mean, they're looking for intelligent meat, right? Uh, that's, you know, kind of the, the curse that, that Yi and Agu put on them. They've got this endless hunger. Uh, so when they can't find it, though, they do maybe occasionally turn on each other, sort of, kind of, a little bit. Uh, now, those that are killed in, in like, inter-band fighting uh, do get their bones uh, preserved by their by their comrades uh, until a pack lord or a flind can perform a ritual to Ianagu that turns them into undead followers that are known as witherlings. Uh, now, even after death, they do serve the war band, but they are not as formidable as they once were. However, they are pretty much un, well, not unstoppable but they won't they're relentless okay they they're not unstoppable but they won't stop uh, these guys will pretty much kill anything in their path except they don't eat so it leaves more flesh for the rest of the warband uh, having a lot of these guys as frontline fodder just makes sense uh, if as a dm you are controlling a warband uh, however, they can't really wield anything much more than, you know, a simple club. Although, the club they have in the book this guy wielding here is more than just a simple club. It looks pretty pretty gnarly. Uh, anyways, so they have an AC of 12 and 11 hit points. Their speed is 30 feet. So, I mean, they're not exactly challenging. In fact, their challenge rating is only one quarter. Uh, their strength is above average at a 14. Their dex is a little below. And then their con is above. Intelligence, wisdom, and charisma, though, are lacking. Uh, these things are not smart, they are not intelligent, they are a little bit strong and have some constitution, so they're, they're fighty, they don't do anything else, they're there to fight. Uh, they are immune to poison, again, these guys are undead, it's just bones that have been reanimated. Uh, they are immune to exhaustion and poison, they got dark vision and a below average passive perception. They understand null, but they can't speak it. So they can maybe get some orders, but they couldn't respond in turn. Uh, for abilities, they get rampage. Uh, when the Witherling reduces a creature to zero hit points, uh, with a melee attack on its turn, it can take a bonus action to move up to half its speed and make a bite attack. Uh, that's kind of neat. For actions, it gets a multi-attack. It can make two attacks, one with its bite and one with its club, or two with its club. Uh, its bite is a plus four, it does a d4 plus two, and the club is a plus four, and it's a d4 plus two as well. Uh, bite, of course, is piercing. Club, of course, is bludgeoning. Now, for reaction, it does have Vengeful Strike. So in response to a null being reduced to zero hit points within 30 feet of the Witherling, the Witherling makes a melee attack. So that's a very simple yet interesting thing that it can do. Uh, like I said, if you are going to have a warband, you are going to have these guys as your front line. Uh, they're cheap, they're easy, they don't require uh, sustenance. You can have a lot of them without having to worry about supplies. And with this Vengeful Strike, if one of them goes down to zero, the rest of them get to make a melee attack. Now, I know that it's a reaction, so it only gets to do once. If, like, two of them drop, they don't get to do it multiple times. But even still, having these guys make an extra, which, let me make that clear, is a third attack, changes things. Uh, on top of that, with their Rampage, uh, when it reduces a creature to zero hit points, it can move and make another attack. Like, these guys can get around the field and attack multiple times. Now, their hit isn't entirely potent, but they get a lot of them. So if you get you know, seven or eight of these, yeah, maybe they're only a CR one quarter, but that could severely impact what even, you know, a third or fourth level party is doing, depending on, unfortunately, how smart your players are. So, like, these guys, they've got some interesting things that you have to manage, but you can easily make these things a lot scarier than the CR one quarter that they are. Uh, anyways, Dan, I think I hear my friend coming. Let me go talk to him. And I will be back to talk to you guys next week. Until then, uh, stay safe. My favorite thing about Dave discussing D&D &D is his 
obvious contempt for the intelligence of his players? You know, you know he does this with players in general. I don't. Mm. David DM'd for so long with so many different people that I don't know if he's always just the smartest one at his table or if he prioritizes things differently than everyone else and therefore thinks he is but man does he fucking think players are dumb uh, like i he's either a dick or he's just cynical i can't figure out which oh i think it's both okay yeah fine yeah, yeah i guess those aren't mutually exclusive okay i got a question for you though sure um speaking about the witherlings and whatnot dave said something that made me think and do you know what separates man from the animals the evolutionary advantage that humans have language no nope. No, no, no. You have crows and dolphins and stuff that can communicate with each other. Thumbs? Uh, what about gorillas? Um, the thing that makes us a better hunter than every other hunter out there. Indoor in- plumbing. I'm pretty sure that ants actually have some sort Son of... Son of a bitch. Anyway. <laughs> Sliced bread? Um, hold on, I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> Monkeys raiding a bakery. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say seagulls every time I pull out a sandwich. <laughs> Um, no. Hey, look, this one's now open faced. <laughs> Fucking birds. Yeah, the birds got an open face, motherfucker. <laughs> All right, so, um, Seagull Eric Coker have got to be the most annoying fucking things in the Oh my god, now I'm just mad. Mine, 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 mine. Anyway, mine. anyway, so the actual evolutionary advantage that we have as hunters, the reason that we are able to hunt lions. Imagination? It, uh, it's not, it, it's not that. I mean, that's something that we have developed over time but stop thinking i will tell you if you let me finish my sentence dan okay the reason that we have an evolutionary spark above um sharks or cheetahs or um even like bears right is actually our our um longevity for the hunt we don't have to be faster than you we just have to last longer it is our endurance and that is what makes Knowles so fucking scary is they don't stop. Your guys will get levels of exhaustion while these knolls will continue to hunt them down. This makes me sad because I get winded after climbing half a flight of stairs. Yeah, but even our our sick and infirm will still need to rest shorter periods of time than a dog who's been run ragged, right? We will continue to hunt and follow and follow and follow. You ever see the movie It Follows? No. Okay, for those of you who haven't, the enemy... I mean, it's a giant fucking metaphor, but we're not going to get into that. The enemy is an invisible creature that no one else can see, feel, touch, whatever. And only one person can see it. But it comes at you Terminator 2 style. And it never stops walking. It doesn't tire. And when it catches you, it will rip you to shreds and everyone else will just sit there and watch it happen. And there's nothing you can do. You cannot fight it. it. It has to go through doors and around buildings, but it will never ever ever stop if it hits a locked door it will break that door down and continue to come that is how Knowles operate that's badass that's 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 fucking scary that's basically michael myers from or mike myers from halloween no michael myers mike myers is in austin powers it's a little different (laughs) but uh, but no that's that's the thing from they say that from from an evolutionary standpoint that is the thing that humans had is our ability to to just outlast that's how we can hunt buffalo. Cool. Buffalo are faster than we are, but we did it on foot because they will tire out first. Hmm. Cool. I mean, thumbs and, and being able to stand upright and use tools also fucking helps, but that was the thing that got us to that point. All right, Adam. So that said, do you give a shit about these two attacks that these They're guys They're fucking get? identical. One of them is bludgeoning and one of them is piercing. Yeah. I, I don't ki- Does this ever fucking come up? By the time that your guy gets your your player gets immunity to one thing or another, they're going to pick slashing every time. Well, right? the only form of uh, immunity you or even resistance you get of physical damage at this level is when you rage, which includes all three. Yeah, anyways. so like, does it fucking matter? Yeah, and, it's whoa, whoa, whoa. so rare. Is it separated between slashing, piercing, and bludgeoning now? Yeah, and so and honestly, I don't I don't care. Like, this is not a this is not a big deal. There's no other mechanical difference here to these two attacks it's weird that they they felt the need to have two okay i don't know why they didn't just have them bite or uh, and be done with it right just be more feral because they're fucking witherlings anyway um i noticed that uh, vengeful strikes says in response to a knoll being reduced to zero hit points okay what constitutes a knoll i know a hyena doesn't but does a witherling because it's undead yes because it actually says 
under the knoll that they are a humanoid and in brackets knoll. Does Witherling say undead knoll? No, it says undead. Then no, I wouldn't count that. I would say it needs to have the descriptor knoll. Yeah, and that's and that's where you find it, right? I'm the same way. Your witherlings will not get it. I know that they're technically gnolls still. They move with the pack and whatnot. Sure. But I'm not going to. I'm not going to give this to them. I mean, not that Yinogu would be dropping in the middle of a battle while these guys are still alive, but he wouldn't trigger this either because he's a fucking fiend. Yeah. Right. So there, because of the way that the knoll warband is built, you can have the cultists there, and if a human drops. The Witherling does not get this Vengeful Strike. Because mm. it's not a fucking knoll. Just wanted to throw that out there. It's something that most DMs will probably miss. So now that we've covered an undead member of the Warband, let's interrupt Terry's binge drinking. Are you binge drinking now? I'm binge drinking. I f- now it's just... Fucking knolls! <laughs> <laughs> so now we just covered an undead member of the Warband. Let's interrupt Terry's binge drinking to discuss a fiend that walks amongst them. Remember that these unique kinds of gnolls can be affected by Detect Evil and Good Spells and its protection counterpart. Thanks, Adam and Dan, for handing it back over to me. My name is Terry. I'm still at the Green Dragon Inn. I'm now so drunk that I seem completely sober. I've gone full circle, and I can't think of a better time than for us to talk about Null Fangs of Yinogu. So a Null Fang, that's Fang with a G, not Fan, though they are fans of Yinogu as well, are are, are this. So Nulls celebrate their victories by performing demonic rituals and making blood offerings to Yinogu. Sometimes the Demon Lord rewards his worshippers by allowing one of them to be possessed by a demonic spirit. So marked as Yinogu's favourite, the lucky recipient becomes a Fang of Yinogu, the chosen Null Lord. In much the same way, Yinogu created the first gnolls, a hyena that feasts on a fang slain foe, undergoes a horrible transformation, becoming a full-grown adult gnoll. Depending on the number of hyenas in a region, a fang of Yinogu can lead to a startling increase in the gnoll's population. Finding and killing the fang is the only way to keep the population in check. So fangs of Yinogu are gifted with the power to spawn more gnolls. They anoint the remains of their foes using bizarre rituals. A hyena that feeds on such a corpse spawns a gnoll, while other humanoids who join in the feast become cultists of Yinogu. Fangs use their claws in battle, the better to imbue their victims with uh, the magic needed to spawn more gnolls. So let's look at the stat blocks. Let's look at how these fangs of Yinogu are, are different to that of regular gnolls. So an easy way to put it is their stats are just higher in most regards, okay? But by at least three points mostly here. So even strength, we're getting to, to high end, close to what you might see of a, a fighter PC, strength of 17. A dex is higher as well, of 15. That is con as well. Their intelligence and their wisdom are that of an average human being. Now, I know you think, you people out there, that you're not average. Everybody thinks they're special in their own way, and I'm sure you have some talents. But I want you to understand that these null fangs of Yinogu are essentially just as intelligent as you. Their problem-solving is that of yours, though they will themselves have their own innate characteristics on how they do things. Even their charisma is higher. Remember, charisma is your, your influence on your understanding of people, and what comes from that is how well you can intimidate people so so bear that in mind when we compare that to a regular null their charisma is way higher wisdom is a, is around about their sims so their understanding of the world around them is very similar but their academic intelligence is much lower regular null but their strength dex and con is also much lower so while we may not see these fangs of Yinogu as leaders in the sense that we as 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 civilized people, I say being from the UK, uh, would see them, they're definitely going to be seen as leaders among this Knoll population. So how are we going to use them then? I love Knolls because of their because of their ferocity and how they just move forwards unapologetically and essentially just rampage everything in front of them and that's a shared ability between the Knoll Fang of Yinogu and a regular Knoll, this rampage ability. So understand this, if you have a dense population of NPCs, we're thinking level zero, Baker and the Wife, NPCs in an area, they will be overrun and overwhelmed very quickly. So depending on the mission that you have, if it is to protect these people, understand that if they're condensed, they will be overrun very quickly. With regards to tactics, this leads me, I'm a little bit of a fan of military history, shocker, right? But it leads me to a strategy that was used um, 
by the Germans in World War II and also by the Japanese um, to some degree in the Pacific as well. It's, it's a strategy called Blitzkrieg. The German Blitzkrieg translates to Lightning War. And uh, it's a strategy that the Germans were able to use against the Allies, uh, which makes me a little bit mad. Side note on this, the, the war could have been over very quickly had the, had the British and the French not dug in after the Germans had used Blitzkrieg against the Polish. If they'd, if they'd moved forward and not dug in, the war could have been over very, over very quickly. But they allowed the Germans to, to reformulate, resupply, and use this Blitzkrieg tactic, which is essentially to move forward and advance as quickly and as powerfully as you can to penetrate a hole in any defenses because once you do that you're unstoppable providing you don't wear yourself thin most defenses are created in in the sense to, to stop somebody passing a line but if they're able to pass that line especially very quickly it can be difficult to stop them because your strategy was never intended for the people to be behind you or around you and so use this as a dm when it comes to controlling nulls we do not have to overwhelm them from all sides we don't have to take them on from all sides but if you can penetrate their line whatever it is that they're trying to stop through overwhelming numbers and using this rampage technique and you end up around them surrounding them because you got past that line you can cause overwhelming damage and you can create a phenomenally fun and challenging a situation for the PCs in which they have to get on the back foot and think on the fly how they're going to react to this. Um, and remember that gnolls are going to do this in a way that you, we say humans, you know, humanoids in the game are not necessarily going to think about. If there is a road and there is an encampment or a settlement at, along that road, naturally we think to defend the line on the road and stop people coming along that road and getting past. Gnolls aren't necessarily going to think like this. They're going to see that your defense is on the road and they're going to go around the road. They're going to go through the trees. That's perfect for them. It provides cover. They're in their natural environment. They're essentially hyena people. It makes perfect sense for them to do that, whereas a humanoid may not necessarily think of doing that. They would think the most efficient route, which is the road. So, when it comes to gnolls and using the gnoll fang of Yinogu as the leader, my advice would be to think Blitzkrieg. Do a little bit of military, uh, military history. Think outside of the box and the way that you're going to go about it. Penetrate that line called absolute chaos. Use the higher hit points of the Noel Fan of Yinogu. And I didn't mention it earlier. Their hit points, their armor class is higher. Armor class 14. Hit points is 65. Um, to lead that pack, get through that line and watch those PCs squirm and panic once you get past that line of defense. You don't even know what you want. You don't even need to know what you're going to do after that. Just get through that line and watch them panic. It's that type of panic that in the middle of the game, it's awful, but afterwards you're laughing. Okay, so that's no Fang of Yinogu. Look a little bit in a World War II history. Look at some Blitzkrieg that was used by the Germans and the Japanese in the Pacific, and uh, and you'll have a lot of fun with it. Okay, Adam, Dan, thanks very much. Over to you. I'll talk to you guys soon. Okay, interestingly to me, this is one of the handful of times when you see a heavy hitter on the front lines. Yep. Right? Sure, their AC is 14 and their hit points are... 10d8 plus 20, which helps, but they don't get a single ranged attack. They're the only ones, I mean, besides the witherlings, right? Mm -hmm. So um, th these guys don't even carry weapons. They're front and center sucking up damage as they charge forward because they've got the pool of hit points. They've got a decent AC. I mean, it's not as good as a knoll with a shield, but it's still better than gnolls without a shield, yep. right? And I mean, especially considering that they've got bonuses to con, wisdom, and charisma saves like they're going to be up there taking that first volley and we know that when you have an enemy charging forward your players are going to blow their big spell slots early oh yeah yeah right so this is another way that a null warband is frightening you see witherlings and the fang of yunogu first then i think you see gnolls and then and the only reason the gnolls aren't keeping pace with them is because they will stop and shoot mm -hmm. so they're going to be one round behind yeah Right, and so then you have the gnolls, and then behind them is the pack lord, and then behind them are the hunters. Yeah, I, I, I love the fact that these guys soak up. They're the, basically the barbarian in a tribe full of barbarians. Oh yeah, right. But they're like the class barbarian. These these are the gnolls that are the veterans. Like I, yeah. I'd say, um, I mean, these guys are even. I, are they going to tell a pack lord what to do? No, they're more concerned with the their own personal relationship with Yanogu. Uh, Terry talks about how they're they're doing dark rituals and shit. Yeah. The Pack Lord isn't doing that. The Pack yeah. Lord is is managing the battle. 
And these fangs are obviously, they're intelligent enough, they're wise enough, but they're also hardy enough to get in there and fuck shit up. Yeah, I mean, at a CR4, these guys are heads and shoulders above the pack lord for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's going to be another one of these situations where we saw with the, yeah, the Claw of the Luthix. Um, because they are so much more powerful than an orc war chief, but are subservient to them, or at least lower on the pecking order, right? And I think it's because they're more interested in worshipping Yanogu or caring for the young, like the uh, um, Clav Luthic, Luthic yeah. is. Um, these guys have their own machinations and stuff. It, it They kind of feel like Jafar to me, just... Far more savage, far more feral. Uh, yeah, but I don't even think they're advisors. It's just they're doing the necessity. Like, they're the ones that are picking through the bones to create more witherlings. They're yeah. the ones that are setting it up to get the hyena over here to eat this corpse. Right? That's what they're there for. Um, and they're their, looking... gr- their interest is growing the war band and, and like, Whereas, bringing the glory to, you know. Well, except that there's no glory. But, yes. Yeah. I, I, ideally, that we're on, we're staying on mission and we need more guys. Whereas the pack lord is sitting there going, right, okay, we got guys, let's fucking go. Yeah. Right? And so I think it's the two halves that work together. I also feel like you're going to get more of these fangs of Yunogu than you are going to get a pack lord. Oh, yes. Yeah, Because there's only agree. one leader, but you can have four or five of these guys. But with the CR4, that keeps these guys relevant up into higher levels. Yep. Right? And even the pack lord will drop as a CR2. But can you imagine what this, uh, what was it, Insight Rampage? On a bunch of these motherfuckers? Like, yeah. Right? And we haven't even touched Flynn's or anything. We're doing that next episode. The real big heavy hitters in the Noel uh, arsenal are or yet next, to come. Are, are going to be next yeah. week. Yeah. So, so these guys, unlike the other mobs we've covered to this point, we don't have to rely on sheer fucking overwhelming numbers. Yeah. I I don't know, man. But the fact that these guys could also speak Abyssal, where nothing else can, I feel like they just kind of <laughs> use it, do it to talk amongst themselves. It's not and, common. And... No, like, there's not a Noel that speaks common. No, yet, there's right? not. So. I, 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 th- I think, I think Wizards is doing a really, really um, focused job of making sure that these are enemies, these are antagonists, these are things you fight. Yeah. These are not characters to play. I have had NPC Noles that are just like part of a pirate ship. You guys that, that mm-hmm. dealt with one, yep. right? And so they're around. But they are the nasty member of the crew. Yeah. And don't ask why he's being so good. We keep the fog of hunger lifted off of him. Don't ask us how. Yeah. Right? Yeah. There, and, there's going to be that to it. We we, we have... Uh, it, his answer, by the way, was he had a chunk of troll jerky. Because trolls are technically intelligent creatures. And they will regenerate. So over time, the troll jerky would regenerate enough that he could eat it. And then he would knock back down to the bone. And then the troll jerky would start to grow again. So he was keeping a troll, like a troll thigh. Yeah. So he was he was keeping a troll, like from regenerating by eating the severed limb over and over and over again, right? And and gnawing on, and that's how he was staying, folks. But if he ever lost it, you would have a knoll murdering people on the pirate ship. Jeez. Right. So it's terrifying. But, yeah, but you're not going to see these guys as an average NPC. You're right. Um, now this ability to speak abyssal, uh, I think of it less as a communication way even though it's a language and that comes with all the bells and whistles of language but this is specifically for the rituals and the it's like them using the holy tongue of yenogu or or the 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 consecrated or desecrated i guess tongue of yenogu i also feel like when yenogu is on the battlefield he will be surrounded by these guys and not pack lords and that's why yeah yeah that makes sense so before we move on um, I just want to thank everybody that's been a part of this process. We're, what, fucking it, seven episodes into yeah. this. It has been, I mean, Dan, you know, it takes us roughly three times as long to put together one of these multi-clip episodes as it does a regular Yeah, one. They're, they're a bit of a headache, but they're kind of a, nece- a necessary evil at this point. Yeah, um, but thanks to everyone out there. I know it's fucking awkward to sit in your bedroom and, and record into a microphone by yourself. and like I do a lot of things in my bedroom by myself, Adam. Yeah, I hope you don't record it though, Dan. But I know these guys are sitting there and they are busting their asses to go over these stat blocks and and to work with us. And I just yep. wanted to say thanks to everybody. COVID isolation sucks. It's been a team effort through and through. Um, and uh, everybody except uh, Dave has been absolutely fantastic. Yeah. 
I just want to remind everybody that you can find you say, us. Yeah, you roll right along with that. There's no yeah. like, all right, cool. Yeah. Fuck you, Dave. I do, I do the edits. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Pepperina has been great. Jeff has been fantastic. Nick, every, all these other guys who have popped in have been great. Dave's a piece of shit. It's that look in his eye. You can just see the look in the his eye. The one when... eye. The other eye just kind of slowly drifts to one direction. Anyways, I just want to remind everyone that you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and at r slash it's a mimic on Reddit. You can always reach out to us through our email at info at it's a mimic dot com because we love hearing from you guys and any questions that you send us will get added to the lists for our upcoming mailbag episodes. Okay, Adam, um, we have a couple times hit the fact that there is um, this certain mob structure that we have in mind, this, this certain build of what a war band looks like. Using the stat blocks that we've seen today, let's roll and build a warband. Cool. I got a nat 20. Oh, and I got a 17. I wasted a fucking 17. Okay, so... Um, Hold up. Before anything, social encounters are not really a fucking thing. We're not even... No. You, you got to bend over backwards to get that. Environmental encounters, you are not entering null territory. You are maybe following or finding evidence. Yeah. Right, so the fact that a null warband is a rampaging wave that only stops once destruction has been wrought um, means you are going to be chasing them, or they are chasing you. There's no other way about it. Yeah, and and so anyway, so we're we're gonna be looking at combat mostly for gnolls then. Right? Yeah, it's interesting to me they gave us all this shit about null omens and stuff. They can't even fucking communicate. Well, we saw the the gnashing teeth and the cloud in the sky. No, we well, just... I and I think they bring that in, and and that is going to be the only way you could do a social encounter. So let's bring it up now. That is going to be brought in when you have a like very small null raiding party. It's not going to be a full war band. It's not going to be a big thing, but you're trying to distract them from a thing. That is something that your wizard or your cleric with thaumaturgy can use to create this noise, this distraction that is something the gnolls will see and avoid. Because it's you give them that, you know, uh, laughter in a different direction or you will have a tree break in front of them so they know that this way is a bad way to go. Yenogo has decided this way is a bad way to go, so they go the other way, right? That's it. Right, the the social encounters with gnolls are going to be so surface level. They're going to be interactions. They're not going to be like conversations. Yeah, that's one of the things that we said about the kobolds. Was you speak to your kobolds? Yes, Megan, we get it. But you can go and negotiate with kobolds. Yes, right. You can go talk to a hobgoblin. Warrior. Give me all that gold. I have twelve shovels. Yeah, right, right, yeah. Um, but when it comes to gnolls, you're not you're not bartering. No, if 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 you are standing alone in front of some gnolls, it's a it's going to be a bad day for you. Okay, now um, let's build a quick little warband here. For me, the lion's share of the gnolls are going to be standard gnoll and hunters, probably a fifty fifty mix of the two. I would all I would honestly say two thirds of this. You're right. So I, I would take the last majority of them. I would look at this and say that I'm going to beef it up with a couple of other bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. um, but I would honestly say. 50% Noel, 30% Hunter, 20% Hyena. Yeah, I, I was going to say, like, for every three Noles, there's a Hyena. Yeah, and so that's, that's I want four Noles, but sure. Like, that's, yeah. that's kind of it. I don't, I think that Hunters are specialized. They've got a weird specialty to them, yeah, which means that there's going to be fewer of them in the Warband. But also, they're around, there's going to be lots of them. Yeah, and, and the the fact that they equal the CR with a normal null, yeah, they're they are more specialized with this ranged attack, but the fact that they are the same CR leads me to believe that they're going to be fairly equal. My only thing is that one of their major functions is to provide range support or clean up the battlefield afterwards, taking out both gnolls yeah. and victims that are still alive. You don't have half of your warband doing that, right? When you look at your archers to your infantrymen when it comes to the like old um, medieval battle tactics. Yep. You have a fuck ton of archers. You do, but it's not a 50-50 split. <sighs> Where I agree with you, your old medieval army, legion, whatever you want to call it, isn't consuming the bodies of the dead when they're done. You don't know that. The majority of the old medieval warbands, legions, whatever you call them, weren't eating the dead. You don't know that. History is written by the victors. They maybe, they maybe were eating the horses. That's a thing that we know happened. Yep. But 
I, I, I don't like that's why I put them a little bit like I put these two types of Noel far closer. They're very similar. They're so, very similar. So I would forgive a 50 50 split, but I could also say yeah. it absolutely would. Like, there's a reason they're going to pick up shields. As a matter of fact, I would almost have them be like, they're a hunter until they can find a shield. Um, I would almost say, well, shields are going to be easy to come across, especially if you're fighting, like, your standard humans. A lot of humans are going to have, like, that barrel lid shield. Right, I know, which, which is why I would have them outnumber, like, the regular gnolls would outnumber. The them. only reason why I say that is because the the ingenuity of crafting these barbed arrows, which they would have to craft... Um, is, is it a crafting, special trait. Is it crafting if you just smash it against rocks? Yes. Is it? That, yes. That, I don't that, consider that That is that how crafting. primitive men crafted tools. I don't consider that crafting. Well, I mean, it is. It is It is fabricating. It is taking something and changing its form to provide a service and a function. It is crafting a tool. It is crafting a weapon. I'm, it's I'm, just incredibly primitive crafting. I'm telling you're, you're talking to someone who is a crafter. I, I'm telling you, Dan, that you're right. I'm just being pedantic to piss you off. It's working. Good. <laughs> Anyways. Rampage, uh, bitch. So the um, pack lord, I would say, is only uh, individual depending on the size of the warband. If the warband is larger, of course, then... We didn't talk about them today, but flins are going to come in and then flins are going to be taking that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? At that point, a pack lord performs a function much like a sergeant or a captain or a, or a um, troop lead, right? They're going to be disseminating information from the big honcho. But for every pack Again, lord... I don't think they're disseminating much information. They're just going to be... Yeah, I, I will manage this group over here. Hey, you fuckers, come over this it, way. Yeah, right? no, that's exactly what it is. Um, that said, for every pack lord, uh, there are between two and four fangs of Yanogu. You think so? Yeah. That makes these um these fucking crazy war bands big and difficult. We're talking you can have a cobalt tribe, the whole tribe be a CR12. What what you just described is a CR23 war band. Yeah. And I th I don't think that gnolls come in in small numbers as a general rule, right? Because they're consistently making more. Yeah, um that being said, I do think because the essence of Yanogu on this world is kind of seen a bit like a plague, right? Like they gnolls are popping up everywhere. Yeah, yeah they'll the world, wipe them out. Right? Um, you have small war bands that are just popping up inexplicably everywhere in the world. So I think, yes, you will find smaller war bands, but if they gain the momentum, then they become a significant issue but you only need like 30 of them to yes. be a significant so issue. that's why you'll have like these rural villages and small settlements and strongholds actively getting parties and and uh adventuring groups to go out and call those gnolls before they become an issue we oh. know they're out there go out there and kill them we can't so we can't support you i think that small farming villages and whatnot are going to Get a whiff of gnolls and say, fuck it, I'm heading to the city. You do not survive gnolls. Yeah. You can survive goblinoids, right? You can barter with orcs. You do not survive gnolls. Yeah. Um, what uh, Do you have anything to add? Honestly, they're re relatively one note. Uh, my big, my structure shift would um, depend on the size of, of the warband. Yeah. Yeah. If there's nine or ten, I'm not even going to have a fang of Yinogu. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Right? When I'm getting up into the 15, 20 members, there's probably one or two, as well as the pack lord. Right? I'm not really getting into a flind until much later. Look, I've got higher numbers. Yeah. But they've got a bunch of fucking crazy allies that are, like, demonic and shit as well. We're going to be talking about next. Like, we're only halfway through talking about gnolls. <laughs> and I think there's only one gnoll stat block, like, true gnoll stat block that we didn't cover in this episode. Right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot more to, to hit around this. And so we're going to see these war bands shift and change. But I, I think no two will be the same. And it doesn't, it's not like they're flying banners. No. There's no color coding to those gnolls that wear the blue sashes, right? They're not, oh, and I, I did an evil campaign. So I had different tribes of gnolls. Yeah. And some of them would uh, use ash to paint one half of the face white, and the others would, would use um, bloody handprints. And so. Um, and th this is how I was differentiating between them. 
But in true D&D lore, that's orc shit. That's not gnoll shit. Yeah. Gnolls aren't doing... They're not They're not saying, this is my individuality compared to that warband over there. They don't even have fucking names. Right? These guys are just monsters. Yeah. Um, if we are homebrewing NPCs for uh, gnolls, let's just discuss about that really quick. Okay. Do you want to break down the sure. stats? On so that? basically you get plus two strength. Yep. Minus two int. Sure, why not? I mean, that tracks their feral yep. not book learn. They get rampage. Sure. And they get dark vision. 60 feet of dark vision. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, sure. But why the fuck would you? Yeah. Right? I mean, I, I'd give uh, it. Uh, some of them make sense. Like having a, a veteran. A veteran. Yeah. But uh, a mage. Merchant. No. No. Yeah. Right. So honestly, I've, I'm going to use this so rarely. I'm just going to grab a different kind of null. Yep. Yeah, yep. that's fair. Uh, okay, so let's roll the dice. Let's uh, give a plot hook and a campaign idea each. Sure. Got a 13? I got a 2. Okay. I wasted my fucking 17. Oh. Um, so for my plot hook, I love this idea that the um, Noel essence is kind of like this plague that goes across the land. And I want to start it with using this exploding Noel, like exploding hyenas, because they've consumed and consumed and consumed to start the war band. And I want that to be the main plot hook where you go in um, a bunch of farmers at this town or in this uh, farmstead have come over, hired your party because their farmland has been overrun with hyenas. I think that any influx in hyena population has to be an omen that you know is coming. Yeah, right? So your party then goes to find a bunch of dead hyenas everywhere exploded from the inside out and then the arrows start to fly at you and a handful of like bloody footprints walking with paw prints yeah like. right and and so your party finds the dead hyenas maybe one in the process of exploding if you get there soon enough but it's basically an ambush set up by the gnolls at that point Okay, so I, I I really like that, and I like the idea of also starting that early too in a campaign. Where you know when you're, you're fucking rat catchers, you know for the first couple of levels, you could get really carried away when you're doing like level one stuff. I find level one is hard to prep for. Oh, because everything's super deadly. Because super deadly, right? Like, but I want to throw a bar guest at you guys, and everybody's all like, "Dan, we're level one," and I'm like, "But a bar guest." Right, but when it comes down to hyenas who are CR zero, I really like the idea of you guys at a low level, or you're we joined an adventuring guild, whatever it is, right? But I like the idea of there being a board with a whole bunch of different missions, and mm -hmm. one of them should always, always, always be hyenas are on the outskirts of the farmlands. Go call the hyenas. Yeah, it's boring. There's nothing to it, but over time, as they level, as time passes in the world. The hyenas become more and more and more of a problem until now you got gnolls. Yeah, right. I like it. And so, like, just building on your thing, I would start dropping those hints early. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where like a small pack of uh, hyenas, and then the next time they come and check the board, a large pack of hyenas, and then the next time they come and check the board, some gnolls have been seen. Right. Yeah. And like this is like three or so levels in between each but, visit. But but every time that, that they don't do it, there are more hyenas, there's more problems. Yeah. Just, right? And if they do it, nothing happens. And there will just be some hyenas next time. There will always be some hyenas. But if they wait. Oh, it gets bad. Like a bunch of times. Now you've got a war band oh, yeah. on the horizon and your party's like, we're still level eight. And you're like, well, you should have taken care of those hyenas, guys. Pretty much. All right, so for my thing, I've got a major fucking issue with the fact that, logistically speaking, when a hyena explodes, do you know how big a hyena is? I mean, they're not small. They're not small. They're, they're, they're bigger about... than a coyote, but they're smaller than a wolf. Right? Yeah. So how do we get a seven to nine foot tall humanoid that steps out of it? I Demon shit. Demon shit. Absolutely demon shit. In my brain, there are gnolls in the abyss, in the, what were the, the dells, whatever? The death dells. The death dells that are in there. Holding fucking low level demons, um, your your mayonnaise, not yep. mayonnaise, but your your mayonnaise. Uh, holding jars of Hellman's. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so and but they're sitting there holding these guys, waiting for that small portal to open up, and when the blood explodes, that portal is open for a heartbeat, and then they toss one of these low level demons through, and it pops out a knoll on the other side. Hmm. 
That's where gnolls really come from. Just it's a there, ritual that has to happen. Just sitting there chanting, tangy zip, tangy zip, tangy zip. That was your nickname in college. So. Gross. <laughs> so, Glad I didn't go to college. <laughs> but I like the idea of your players having to find a way into the abyss. Mm-hmm. And the only way that they know that there are common momentary abyssal openings is um, when there's these, um, when a knoll is created. So what they have to do is get a hyena to feed, open up a portal, use their item of time stop, which will give them four plus one rounds. Yep. And then everybody has to jump through the portal and then it closes behind them. Yikes. I just think it's a really cool way of getting into the abyss. I like it. And that I could drop in any campaign as just a way to, if you need to get in there. Cool. So do you have a mini, do you have a campaign at all? Um, I mean, Knowles are so one note that it, it. It's hard to make a campaign. It's hard they to make be a, a campaign. a with threat them. at any level. But they're not really the focus of a campaign until you start talking about the bigger guys that we'll talk about next week. Yeah. Um, but this idea of the Knowles slowly. Uh, like gnolls will avoid these large points, these large uh, like strongholds, and they'll start strategically taking down these outlying village villages. So if I'm running like a, I don't know, a little six session mini campaign, you are there to destroy and protect as many villages as you can. And depending on how many villages you get versus how many villages the gnolls get, um, uh, Depends on how big the war band is yep. for the final session. Yep. Now, the way I would track this is a really cool way because you have these maps like Chult that have these hex grids. Yep. Um, there's also, uh, if you do tournaments or long campaigns in like the Warhammer games, yep. you could get little maps where you move your model through and you could see what your territory capture is. The Total War games have this. All, all like this, yeah, yeah, It's yeah. a common it's, feature. Yep. Um, I would track something like that physically at my table so the party could see the gnolls are pushing here that's where you would have to go and then if they take that realm they get a they get a bonus or the whatever more gnolls pop up yeah right? right and and that goes either way if you manage to get it then you've got this stronghold that'll help you in the end battle and i will tell the players from the start there will be the last session will be a massive battle against a warband and you are spending the next five or so sessions building an army yourself to fight it. Okay. Okay. Um, as for me, as far as a mini campaign, I'm going to come up with a subplot instead of a mini campaign. Because, again, I don't think these guys can actually fucking hold their own campaign for no. a long period of time. But I've seen it enough times, strangely enough, Baphomet coming up. Um, Baphomet, who is Yinogu's arch rival. S- arch right? rival, sometimes friend, sometimes enemy. No, always nemesis. Always they no. have teamed up once or twice, but that never goes well for them and then that feud inflames. Yeah. We so, talked about this when we talked about Baphomet back in the Warlock episode as well. Yeah, but those team ups happened eons ago. Eons ago. And so it's yeah. not likely to happen again. So I have had Baphomet as a warlock patron and a god and someone that Minotaurs look up to in like four little campaigns and shit. People are always relying on Baphomet. He's one of the more palatable demon lords to use as a patron. Yeah. Right? You're not leaning on Dweeblix or fucking... Zugmatoy. Yeah. Or, and, or even Orcus and Demogorgon are hard to deal with. Um, what's the... Uh, Grazd is just going to A lot of people like Grazd. Oh, Pepperina loves Grazd. Oh, a lot of people do. But if you're looking for... You're not going to choose Yinogu. That's going to be hard to play. Yeah. Not for a long campaign, but Baphomet's one of the ones you can. Well, Baphomet is directly opposed to Yanogu. This keeps Knowles as relevant villains all the way through your yeah. campaign. So when you have one player that latches on, either through Warlock Patron or he's a Minotaur or whatever it is, you could even have Baphomet just approach the party and say, look, and just have him act as an evil wizard that needs to get shit. Right? I just need spell components, but... The spell components are the livers... Of newborn humans. So whatever <laughs> whatever it is, um, he can be evil or benevolent. Like it do- he doesn't necessarily have to play evil. It can just be get me this kind of flower. Yeah. Right? But he will give you boons and shit, as it says in Morden Kindness. This puts you directly at odds with Yinogu and Knowles consistently all the way through. Fantastic. And that is how I would 
I would incorporate Knowles to be a consistent, regular threat. I also, me personally, you know how when a demon uh, dies on the material plane and it goes back to yep to hell? I'm going to do that with the Fang of Yunogu. They're fiends. They are, yeah. So I'm going to have them go back to the Abyss. Oh, okay. And they are going to work. Like, there will be roaming packs of gnolls that have not eaten intelligent flesh in a long fucking time down in the abyss. So that's something else that I would I would have down there just to really hit that flavor note. Cool. So anyways, that's a decent portion of what we could find in 5th edition on gnolls. But we're only about halfway done. Don't forget to come back next week. When we cover even more kinds of gnolls, as well as some of their more potent allies. That's it for this episode of the It's a Mimic podcast. If you want to support us, you can head on over to www.itsamimic.com and hit our fancy donate button. Or tell your friends and the rest of your D&D party about the podcast. We're available on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube, as well as most podcast apps. Stay safe out there. Thank you for listening to another It's a Mimic production. Inquiries, shoutouts, requests, and mailbag questions can be sent to info at itsamimic.com. Okay, so um, a little while ago I was having a conversation with Jeff uh, about, <laughs> about a one-shot idea for Knowles. I know he wasn't on this episode, but he and I had a couple of shits and giggles about a thing. So oh, I have concerning. asked him to record it a bit and pitch it. Uh, it is... Ridiculous and stupid, and I love it. Okay. So your group of whatever level adventurers that you choose come to a new city, a small city on the outskirts of a nation or an empire, and they find as they approach the outskirts of the city that there's a parade, that the king of this nation is touring his land. And in the middle of the parade, he is suddenly assassinated under mysterious circumstances that no one can quite figure out. And they end up being tasked by the local government as a third party to try to look into the assassination and help the local government because they're afraid they're going to be looked at poorly, that perhaps the local government killed the king. And they didn't, at least they claim they didn't, and they're hoping that you can clear their name. So the adventuring party makes their way through the city and starts interviewing people that were there, people that were at the parade. And they find, eventually, that there are really only three witnesses that had anything mysterious or questionable that actually agreed with each other, that seemed to point in a direction. And they just, they say something about the grassy knoll, and nobody can quite figure out what that is. But with a little bit further digging... Uh, a little bit of searching outside the city, they find that there's the, the, the corpse of a knoll that's actually half decayed and has grass growing out of it. And they find, eventually, that there's a woman that is connected to the king's household. A woman named Linda. Linda is a necromancer. And her father, B. John, is next in line in the succession. So Linda, the necromancer, raises this corpse of a knoll and tasks it with murdering the king. Her goal, they find eventually, as they dig, was to frame a small island nation nearby named Cuba and start a war. And the adventurers, finding all of this information, managed to stop the war and prevent this small city from being framed for the death of the king. Oh, and by the way, the witnesses, the three people who came up with the evidence required to put all this together, their names were Lee, Harvey, and Oswald. Thanks, guys. Another switching to the different stats with Melodica. Thank you for listening to an It's a Mimic production. <laughs> okay, you're done. <laughs> <laughs>